Okay, so good evening and welcome to General Council of July the 25th. I hope everyone is having an enjoyable evening so far. We do have a number of delegations on our agenda this evening, so we are going to get started uh, right away. With that being said, I'm gonna call for a uh, mover and seconder of the adoption of the agenda and or if there's any new business that needs to be added. added. I'll move. Moved by Michelle, seconded by Audrey to adopt the agenda, uh, the general council agenda of July 25th. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing a motion is carried. So we're going to begin uh, with our first delegation this evening, which we have representatives from the SEED program, which is going to present their report for the 2022 year, uh, and as well as uh, discussing some further opportunities. So with that being said, I believe we have Mike and Piggy on the line, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I want to welcome you both uh, to General Counsel this evening, Scano Sago, uh, and I'm going to pass the floor over to yourselves. So welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone here tonight for uh, allowing us to be present at your meeting. Uh, we're just going to, we're going to share the, the uh, presentation duties. So I'll go with the uh, first four slides and then Mike will take over and talk about the budget. Um, so we'll start with presenting our, our annual report for the fiscal year of 2022, which goes from January to December. And just we'll do a bit of a program summary. So basically the seed committee was jointly developed under a 2002 agreement between the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council and Imperial Oil. We currently have representatives from Six Nations and Imperial where we basically deck develop and recommend programs with focus on employment and education with a focus on science, technology, and trades. We also encourage Six Nations band members to acquire skills and qualifications needed for careers in production or manufacturing industries. And we allocate and steward the annual seed funding. That is our main goals of the committee. Our collaboration has successfully supported a number of educational and employment initiatives with nearly $6 million over the past 22 years. So we're very proud of that accomplishment and being able to support the community in this way. Some of our goals are to utilize the funding to achieve the object objectives of the agreement and to support any engaging programs for the benefit of Six Nations band members and the Six Nations community. We always want to evaluate and measure outcomes of our programs to ensure success. And we do this through a different, different means. Um, and we also do this as a way to ensure that what we're providing to the community is working and that it's also um, showing us areas where we can improve on and make sure that our reach gets out there so that everybody can have access to the funding uh, availability of the, of the committee and the funds that are available through, through the SEED initiative. We also are continuing our collaborative relationship between Imperial Oil and the Six Nations community, building on that and really looking to expand our reach um, again and keeping in mind the lifelong learning. So starting at a younger age and then going right on through to um, older adults, second careers, anything like this. So for right now, our governance is um, we, we are comprised of the Six Nations, um, Six Nations Seed Committee, sorry, is comprised of myself, Peggy. I, I'm a representative of Grand River Employment and Training. Rebecca Jamison is our, uh, represents Six Nations Polytechnic STEAM Academy. Jeannie Martin uh, was our representative for the Grand Erie District School Board. She has recently retired, so we are looking for another representative from that uh, school board. And Noise from Six Nations District Schools. Peggy Ciccone, uh, Mike Ciccone, rather, uh, co-chair for Indigenous and Externals Relations Manager for uh, Imperial Oil. 
Michelle Camilleri, Environmental and Regu Regulatory Lead for Nanticoke, and Jessica Duell, HR Manager for Nanticoke. So right now, uh, we are the current com committee members with the exception of Jeannie Martin. Um, I do have to make an announcement that I have, uh, I am going to be leaving my employment with GREAT and my last day is going to be August 4th. So we'll be looking for a replacement from GREAT. I did meet with our team leads and our CEO this afternoon. And so we do have somebody in mind that can take my place as the, as the representative from Grand River Employment and Training. We do meet quarterly and we review the programs and expenditures and all decisions for funding are made through discussion and consensus. So we, we all decide on how we're gonna spend the money, where that's gonna go, and ensuring that the funds that are allocated are spent in a good way. And whatever may be left over, we have a plan on how to spend that moving forward in the next year. So with that, I'll let Mike take it from here. So he's gonna discuss the budget and any plans that we have for 2023 and moving into 2024. Thanks, Peggy. Um, so the original uh, budget amount from the 2002 agreement was $250,000. And through the, uh, the, ad, the addition of the CPI supplement in 2016, the budget for 2022 was just over $324,000. Um, based on that uh, CPI, um, the Ontario CPI, CPI supplement uh, since then. And all the funds are directed to the programs with a small allocation to support administration, um, administration costs for payments, et cetera. For some program highlights from 2022, um, we're starting with the elementary schools and students. There is just over $44,000 allocated to programs in that area. Things like the Mad Science Summer Day Camps. We supported two weeks of science camp to Six Nations students from grade one to six that were held at uh, Six Nations Polytechnic. We had 50 campers attending, so it was sold out uh, with 37 on the wait list. So there's definitely a lot of demand for that program. We also supported the science fairs uh, and cultural science. Um, virtual learning fairs had replaced fairs and, and uh, during the, um, the pandemic periods, um, as well as some outdoor education activities for traditional ways. Um, and also provided uh, $10,500 to reimburse additional qualification training for uh, 17 um, Six Nations band members for courses that included special ed, mathematics, environmental education, and First Nations and Inuit learning. On the secondary uh, side, we allocated $61,000 towards that. The bulk of that was for support to the homework support program for grades 5 to 12 that's been running since 2006. Uh, $32,000 from SEED was provided in 2022. Uh, to support online and in-person access to teacher tutors. The majority of those being secondary students needing support in math, literacy, research, written essays, and reporting. And approximately 142 secondary and nine elementary students access the online support. And the online training and guidance for students, teachers, and parents, along with one-on-one -on -one tutoring to make sure that their learning needs were being addressed. We also have uh, the STAY Awards to recognize hard work and commitment of the Six Nations students in grades seven through 12 who've achieved top marks in science and math. For 2022, the funding was expanded to include a $1,000 graduate award. And we also increased the award values um, for the, um, the grade levels up to $400 for the top mark um, for the grade 12 and uh, awards and recognition was provided to 18 students and that ranged between $150 to $400 plus $1,000 graduate award. So a total of just over $5,000 was awarded to students. The last item here was career visioning, which was a new initiative for 2022, which provided grade 10s in uh, discovering the workplace and grade 11 studying green industries and careers. The opportunity to actually visit our Nanico operation um, get a bus tour of the site, 
had some speakers to provide information about the uh, the operation and career opportunities uh, and answer some q and a with imperial employees the po the feedback from that was was very positive both from the students and the teachers and we plan to do this again in the fall of 2023 for the uh, six nations steam students Shifting to the post-secondary side, we allocated $26,000. Um, we had increased the funding for scholarships uh, for that year up to $14,000, and we awarded it to 12 students, which we had recognized during a previous, previous council meeting, including one who was enrolled in engineering that received $2,000, one studying a Bachelor of Commerce that was awarded $2,000, and then 10 $1,000 awards to students in programs such as welding, criminology, social work, uh, early childhood education and languages and these students were from Western University, University of British Columbia, Wilfrid Laurier University, Fanshawe College and Six Nations Polytechnic. And one of these Six Nations student, University students was actually hired at the uh, Nanakoke Refinery for four months um, from the uh, Environmental Studies program at Wilfrid Laurier. For Six Nations Polytechnic, they receive a significant amount of the funding, uh, $122,000 for uh, redesign of secondary level math and physics courses to be taught from an Indigenous worldview with relevant context and applications. Um, and extensive redesign was required to complete two of these courses uh, to date. Um, funding also goes to supporting their trades work. Uh, including pathways to trades as well as college and university. And lastly, for GREAT, uh, $63,000 were allocated to fund various training initiatives um, identified by GREAT and in collaboration with OSTTC to offset training expenses for things like welding, their uh, right program, the Work Ready Indigenous Trades Experience, Joint Apprenticeship Training Initiative, Safety and Union Training. Um, and there's also funds there that are uh, awarded as uh, apprenticeship awards and scholarships to help students covering expenses related to ongoing training and tuition costs, as well as cost of living for them and their families. So just a, a bit of an agreement update. Um, as you all know, we did refresh the, uh, the agreement to a capacity building and education agreement that was effective January of this year, and that's uh, for a period of seven years. Um, that continues the funding to support the community programs and initiatives. The Joint Seed Committee continues to allocate funding to the programs and initiatives. And um, it also supports and encourages Imperial and its employees to be engaged in delivery of those programs and to participate in community events. And um, the budget for this year, uh, which was increased from last year based on the CPI adjustment as well, will be starting out at $344,000. So that's the amount that we're allocating for this year's activities. The 2022-2023 plans, the key objective for us is to enhance promotion of the seed programs and opportunities with Imperial, support the development, <clears throat> excuse me, of skills for environmental work, uh, to improve STEM success uh, and high school graduation rates, and to establish seed success metrics, some of those things that Peggy mentioned earlier. New or updated for 2023, we have added a third week of the Mad Science Summer Camp which has uh, again been sold out, sold out in three days, and there's still another 50 campers on the, on the wait list. We increased the allocation for the homework support program to help with rising costs. Uh, we supported the grade seven and eight uh, SNP campus day that was held. Um, career visioning for STEAM Academy students, including the Nanico operations visit, which will happen again. We increased the support for grades right program um, we continued support for a four-month student position at Anacoke, which we were able to fill with an engineering student from Western University, um, and providing opportunities for Imperial to participate in the, uh, in the program deliveries.
So that's it for the materials that we had to uh, to present. I guess the, the last item we wanted to to bring up was to see for an opportunity for us to to recognize the uh, the signing of the of the new agreement as well as the contributions from the uh, from the seed committee and uh, our delivery partners um, to uh, to have that opportunity with representatives from council. So we're open to uh, to your thoughts on that. Hey, thank you, Nyala, for that, uh, both uh, Mike and, and Peggy, for walking us through uh, some of the highlights in the budget to our the SEED uh, program. I'm going to open at this point in time, if I can ask, um, I think it's either Mike or Peggy, to remove your share screen. And then I'll look to Council to open the floor for any further questions or comments for our presenters. I'll start with Helen. Um, the, the agreement a million dollars over seven years. I always thought it was a million dollars over so many years. I was gonna, do you know? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I looked, to, I looked to Mike. I know I just recall seeing uh, this over six million dollars over the inception of the program <laughs> in two years. Uh, Mike? That's right. It was. Uh... Just bring that slide up again. Is it six? It was $6 million over 22 years. Oh, okay. So have we been past the 22 yet? Well, I guess not if it was 2002. Uh, just past. Yeah, it was signed in 2002. So it would be in, the, in that uh, 22nd yeah. year now. So what happens after that? Does it does make another one? We've already signed the new updated one. So I think that's what Mike, Mike's uh, point uh, was at the end is um, some sort of a, maybe a, an opportunity to recognize the new signing. Is that correct, Mike? That's correct. We signed the new agreement in January of this year and it's for another seven years. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say too, like I know the program's done a lot of good for a lot of students. Um, so I'm glad to see that it's still going strong. Thank you. I totally agree. And I know uh, in our conversations of the new signing, I know we're always, even myself, always looking to squeeze a little more wherever we can. <laughs> so always do appreciate as well uh, the work uh, of the of the program itself, because I, I know it's helped so many of our students over the last 20, 22 plus years. So again, do appreciate that work as well. I mean, it's, there's always opportunity, I think, in, uh, in terms of the new uh, signing for another seven years. I, I don't think what would our hours uh, would be up in four, five, six, and eight, around 2027, 20, 28. But I think, um, again, uh, you know, really can see, I think it's when you when you really start to measure out, like, from, you know, the metrics of, of, of how many people have actually, um, you know, have progressed. Uh, from the help of the program, I think that's something interesting to see. You know, maybe we could work with our educators as well, just to see those the impact of you know, obviously not just monetary, but uh, how we're actually uh, further assisting uh, our students and those uh, going through the program. I do see a couple of other hands raised at this point in time. I'll first uh, go to Audrey and then over to Michelle. Audrey, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much. As an educator for forty-two years. I've been there for pretty well a lot of these years, and I see the program working really well, and I'm really pleased to see how much it's grown, especially that homework support program has to be really beefed up so that um, we can help our students who may be struggling in certain areas. And I'd like to move on this one, please. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, thank you, Nala, for that, uh, Audrey. It's moved by Audrey. Um, is there a seconder? Before I go to further question and comment, I'll need to grab a seconder. Again, uh, this is to accept the presentation from our seed uh, committee as information. That's moved by Audrey as a seconder, seconded by Michelle with a oh, question. Seconded. Back over to you. Oh, thanks. Now I'm Malba. Uh, back over to you, Michelle. All righty. Well, Mike, Peggy, nice to see you. Congrats, Peggy, on your uh, next, I guess, chapter in uh, wherever you may go. And so I just wanted to comment. I actually had the... Uh, the, I guess the beauty of working at Campus Day and coordinating Campus Day. So it was really nice to see 
the opportunities and the engagement that students uh, received that day. And so I, I actually, I'm a big proponent as Chief Hill had said, I know there's more money. Is there a possibility of getting more money? And I say that because I know that you're funding tutoring, but there's just so much of a need. Um, I know right now the tutoring that used to run out of the academy isn't running. And so um, is there possibilities to have additional conversations to maybe do annual or another contract to ensure that tutoring is happening? Because I've talked to many parents who really, um, I mean, there was a lot of teachers at the academy and, and they were quite busy. So is to, I guess, complement the agreement that we have? So I think the agreement structure that it does increase each year based on CPI. So the inflation that we've been seeing has certainly been helpful in, in adding money to that, but it also does come with increased increased costs. Um, and I think definitely from the seed committee perspective, as we look at where's the greatest need, we can certainly, you know, identify new ones and, and adjust as, as we have done over the last, uh, over the last couple of years. So if there's a, a need for, more funding at uh, SNP to support the tutoring. That's something that uh, the committee can take in consideration. Okay, perfect. Because these are parties outside of who's in the agreement. So good. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah. For that, Michelle, and I think you know, just to just to even further Michelle's points as well is you know, obviously coming post pandemic, you know, our our students and uh, you know, children need as much and as many supports. Uh, as possible, so obviously do uh, do appreciate uh, you know what we do have it currently in place, but always you know there's always room to improve, and I think always room for collaboration and uh, what that looks like as well, because I know we do obviously have you know through Jordan's principles funding, we as council uh, you know the different organizations outside of council, you know we're really looking at ways of really collaborating to make sure again that. Uh, you know, we're setting our students up for success, and that's what this program really is all about. So again, do appreciate uh, the the partnership uh, and the work and the relationship. And, and as always, again, you know, on behalf of our students, want to say now for the last uh, 22 years and look forward uh, to our our next um, discussions and where we could again possibly uh, improve. And also wanted to uh, join in uh, with Michelle to say congratulations, Peggy. Mm -hmm. I wish you well on your next chapter. Uh, and you. again. I want to say Nyawa for your work uh, at the at the committee level because again um, it's 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 people uh, like yourselves who need to continue this important work so do appreciate all of that. Uh, that being said, I'm going to call for any final questions or comments for our guests on this um, presentation. I do see Greg. Greg, you have the floor. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Mike and Peggy, for the presentation. It's um, always positive. Um, yeah, I no, I just had a question. Um, is um, do you have a, a fairly strong connection to any universities um, that uh, you know that you can refer some of our uh, top students to? Is there is there any uh, connection that you have with uh, any of the engineering schools or science science programs? I think that that is something that we've discussed at a committee level, and and we do see. Um, with the applicants for scholarships specifically that there are students that are out there that are really wanting to move forward and um, have that higher education. I do think that collectively the committee has had some good representation and very strong um, membership with Rebecca and Jeannie and Anne. So a lot of connected people um, as well as working at GREAT and I've only been there for about three years now but really um, being able to connect. So yes, we do have some, we do have some connections. So we, um, we can definitely um, talk more to that as a committee. And uh, maybe if there's anything that you would like that you could send us uh, that we can discuss at the committee level in terms of how you'd like that to look and what, what specifics maybe, uh, then we can, we can discuss that more. Well, me, I guess I'm I'm outgoing, but I can bring that forward to the new committee member, and then they can discuss at the committee level how you'd like that to look. So certainly open to that for sure. Yeah, just a follow up, Chief. 
Um, yeah, I just, because uh, I know that Lakehead University has a, um, an indigenous uh, engineering program, or they do uh, reach out to different um, areas for top students looking to go into engineering. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know they even have a scholarship, actually, actually, just not to blow my own horn, but there is a, a scholarship named after my brother for, for engineering. Mm -hmm. He was, a, he was a, a chemical engineer and graduated from there. So, uh, but that was just something I, I, that's why I asked if you just had a strong uh, connection to the universities. But thank you, thank you very much for the information. Okay, now for that, uh, Greg. Um, so again, uh, looking to any further questions or comments, it's been moved and seconded to accept uh, the seed presentation on behalf of both uh, Mike and Peggy. Uh, it's Melba. I wanna thank the seed uh, committee for, for the report and how Oh, so beneficial it is for assisting many of our people in need uh, in moving forward in their path to success in life. And I'm also sure that parents, caregivers, and all those connected to the recipients are very thankful. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, for that, uh, uh, Melba, I see Helen had her hand raised as well. What is moving? Oh, sorry, it's been moved and seconded. Oh, okay. All right, thanks for that, Helen. Okay, that being said, it's again been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Again, thank you, Nyawa, so much, Mike and Peggy, for joining us this evening. And again, look forward to uh, our, our future discussions. And if there's any further opportunities on the photo op and things like that, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to the, the Chief's office. I know Tammy's online. Uh, we could help coordinate anything like that. So, Nyawa. Okay, Thank Nyawa, you. have a Nyawa. good night. Bye. Thank you. Okay, Council, we're going to continue moving along here. Our next uh, item, sorry, Brooke, if you want to just confirm, is Jeff in the waiting room as of yet? Yes, he's in. He's in the meeting now. Okay, perfect. So if we could allow Jeff Thomas in from First Nations Cable. Uh, this is, again, um, a verbal update uh, for uh, from Jeff uh, on the fiber installation project at Six Nations. So I believe Jeff is online now. Good evening, Jeff. Can you hear us okay? Hello? Oh, there he is. Okay. Say go, Jeff. Um, thanks for having me. Um, this is a, a delightful uh, event for us. I mean, after two years of all this um, political uh, issues we've been having, uh, I bring good news. Uh, we can start our project. It has been started uh, two weeks ago now. We're working in uh, um, the Mohawk first line area. Um, we're installing fiber up there right now. Um, we have a contractor that's burying pipe. Um, a second crew is going to begin uh, on fourth line. Um, probably within the week, and um, we're just going to plug away until we get it done. We got three years to get it done. December thirty first, twenty twenty five. It has to be all done. Um, we hope to have it done in two years. It's, that's our game plan. Um, so this is phase two. We have the main connection to uh, Hydro One's already active and working and performing very well. Um, so this is the part that's going to activate the homes. So probably within the next month or two, we should be having customers on service. So it's kind of a over overview of everything. Okay, thanks. Uh, just thanks for that update, Jeff. Again, really good news. I know it's <laughs> we've been going back and forth and trying also to support uh, you as you know in terms of some of the political pieces. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that things are uh, underway um, and that we can, again, uh, as we all know, the importance of uh, the this project um, and making sure uh, that, again, all of our members in homes have the opportunity to have good quality service. I just wanted to ask a question, Jeff. I know I think we've touched on it before in the past in relation to cell reception. Uh, is that a possibility of the improvement through this project as well? Actually, um, that was the second part of my um, presentation. I wanted to uh, talk to uh, 
band council about their old towers. You have four towers or four or five, I forget which, but uh, we want to uh, access that. We've uh, been running a demo site here uh, off of my tower at the office. We've been working with uh, uh, Carrier One, which is a, a cell service provider, and uh, it's been performing very well. Uh, the issue right now is we got to get some coverage, and the only way to get that coverage is through expansion through other towers. Um, we intend on running fiber to every tower to do our backhauling, which will help improve the issues of uh, delays and any kind of distortions that uh, the self carriers face. So that'll help eliminate a lot of that. But the good side of this all is we're talking like a $30 package, which is something like you can get out of Walmart out of the States. And I mean, this cell phone up in Canada is uh, probably the worst in the world as far as rates go. And there's a lot of people playing a lot of big dollars that are getting very good coverage. I mean, I have uh, customers coming to me telling me they're paying four or $500 a month just to get coverage, you know? And um, the, what we're proposing, um, we're not, we don't have all the packages ready. We still have to do a lot of engineering on this yet. Um, we have to find some towers. Once we find the towers and we can give you a more detailed uh, overview of what it's going to cost and what kind of coverage we're going to get and that type of thing. Okay, yeah, that would be great, Jeff, if we could maybe start to, you know, look at, you know, op options and opportunities, further opportunities within that, because I know our office has been receiving, obviously, in addition to, you know, the internet uh, connectivity problems, um, but also, you know, cell reception. I know even for myself, it's, it's, uh, and even yourself probably, <laughs> down below isn't the, be the best, uh, Salary for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. One thing on the other side, I did sign a deal with Rogers. They're going to be putting a, a antenna site up here on our tower. They're going to be, um, it's already agreed upon. So it's just whenever they get around to doing it, I guess. And um, we consented to link through the fiber from New Credit, their tower to here which will help with the backhauling and all that, like I pre talked about previously. What we'd like to do is um, bring in an engineer and take a look at these towers, uh, if Van's okay with it. And we'd like to see, um, just do uh, an engineering report on the structure of the tower, um, make sure it's up to par. Um, our weight, you know, we got wind, we got uh, ice, we got, uh, a lot of distortions that we have to find out and make sure that uh, those towers can handle that kind of a load. And once we find that out, and uh, I'd like to uh, set up a deal to work with you guys and put a contract together and lease some space on these towers. Well, I think that's that's a, that's a, again getting getting creative, right? Because at the once the fiber installation project is complete, the towers will, in a sense, be null and void, right? Which is where I see could be an opportunity. I mean, obviously not fully null and void. I mean, it could still be utilized even on the space wise, but in terms of the cell reception, I think there can be some opportunities for sure. Absolutely. Um, the way we see it, uh, we want to. I mean. This has all got out of way out of hand. I mean, the price of the cell services nowadays, it's getting crazy. So we want to just bring something in and create a package here for people that don't really need to, you know, 500 megabits for a month and are, are got their whole lives on this thing rather than, you know, I mean, just texting and just use that normally, you know, and I think um, it'll go over very well. Totally agree. I'm wondering now that we have uh, just quickly, if now that we have, um, you know, I guess our, our go ahead, the, the political pieces are complete, we're moving forward further on phases on the project. Uh, we do have Caitlin, our communications officer, uh, or rather communications department um, that works within it. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you uh, and, and Caitlin 
um, can connect to say something on on the next steps to community in terms of maybe I don't know if it's a mapping or you know by this this time uh, next year this area will be uh, in progress or you know I'm, not, I'm wondering if we can maybe develop something like that uh, Jeff to get out to community to help uh, again just alleviate uh, as inquiries. Far, as far as as far as the fiber project goes, that's not a problem. Um, we We've already got a game plan set up with that. Um, as far as the cell phone goes, um, the issue is going to be the towers and whether they can support what we want to do. So I think the first thing that has to happen is uh, we have to bring an engineer in here and uh, evaluate these towers. And that's that's what I'm here asking for tonight as well, is just to see get permission so that we can go ahead and uh, bring somebody in and have them look at the towers. Um, see what kind of dollars have to be put in. If they're not strong enough, there's ways of reinforcing these towers. They're not that you have to abandon them or rebuild them. You can reinforce the foundation. You can reinforce the face of the tower. So there's other ways of, uh, of um, building these towers up so they will meet spec. And that's, I think, is the first step here. Okay, so just going back on the on the fiber internet uh, connectivity project. So if we can, uh, we'll work with your team, Jeff, and our comms team to work on getting some some um, communications out on the mapping and so forth. Right. Um, and then I'm going to open up the floor up for further questions and comments to council on the cell uh, opportunity because obviously there there will be, uh, I would assume, some costs associated with bringing an engineer out. Um, and what does that look like and who's well it would assume those costs obviously we need to get to that point in order to then um, look at the bigger picture of what is the next steps from that point after the engineer uh, is uh, can can get in and, and 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 do that work so um I guess I'll at this point open the floor up for any further questions or comments for Jeff either on the fiber installation project or as well as the uh, cell uh, cell reception and the the opportunities potentially with our existing towers. Opening the floor up for any questions or comments for Jeff. I'm going to first begin with Audrey. Yes. Good evening, Jeff. How are you doing? Very good. And yourself? Pretty good. Thanks. The question I have is who owns the, um, the cell phone uh, company? Where is it from? And also, will it be able to um, do as well as phone calls and texts? Absolutely. I mean, they're they're uh, big in the north. Uh, their their main office is in Toronto. Um, they've been around for a while. They're not a big carrier like Rogers or one of these other ones, Bell. Or, but they they've uh, got their affiliation set up with all these guys. So, like any kind of. Um, um, jumping from tower to tower through roaming and that is all covered. So these phones will work out of the area. Uh, it's just that there's roaming charges ass assigned to that type of thing. And like I said, I don't really want to get into the packaging because uh, there's still some fine tuning that has to be done yet. We don't know the engineering behind it and that's going to be the issue for now. But um, we're looking at a uh, a $30 package, we talked about a, a five meg uh, or a 50 megabit um, data package, including North American calling, um, two megs of uh, roaming, that type of thing for around $30 is what we're talking, which is a very good package. And, um, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll see where that goes. We'll fine tune after once we get the system up and running and we figure out what has to be done here in the community. But uh, we we virtually got to set up a network first before we can really get into any of that. Okay, no. Yeah. No one for that, <clears throat> Audrey, are there any further questions or comments for Jeff? I see Michelle has her hand raised. Good evening, Jeff. Um, Glad to hear that things are moving well and I've actually seen your guys working down on first line. Um, so I think just um, on the whole cell package and, and working that out, can we defer that piece, Chief, so we can do some work and, and discussions over the next month or so and bring that back? 
So I'll move on accepting Jeff's um, um, update. Okay, perfect. I do appreciate that, uh, Michelle. So um, there's a mover on the floor to accept the verbal update of Jeff's uh, of the fiber installation project. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Greg. Uh, and what I will do, uh, Jeff, uh, just on the other, uh, I know you were here for another request, but maybe what we can do is sit down uh, with uh, Darren Jameson as well to come up with a game plan and to see what is the next best steps so that we can bring that back to full council in terms of, you know, bringing an engineering on the cell reception uh, initiative and to, and to further look at the, the bigger picture from that point. So maybe it, it, we could even turn around that quite quickly, to be honest, Jeff. So if you would like over the next uh, maybe two weeks even uh, to come into the office and we could further uh, uh, have a conversation on next steps on that front. What's your schedule like for tomorrow? <laughs> That's how much we want to push this through. Okay, well, I'll have to, uh, maybe Jeff, what I'll do is send you a message, a text message, and we'll go yeah. from there. Say early next week would be good. Okay, yeah, I'll work with you and Tammy and so forth, and hopefully we can get Darren involved as well, uh, and All then right. bring, have our conversation and bring this back to full council. I can actually um, bring... Um, um, carrier one in as well at some point here and uh, have them do a presentation as well. So perfect. So we'll add that um, as part of the uh, next steps. Yeah, as so soon as we get to that that level, then we'll we'll do that. Okay, that sounds good, Jeff. And I'll work through uh, through Tammy as well to get that our meeting uh, set up. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Again, uh, council, just really quickly, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Okay, Nyawa Jeff, we'll talk soon. Okay, on the on the Okay, Council, we're going to continue moving along here on our agendas. Uh, our next delegation we have is an ethics application. Uh, sorry, I believe I see. It. Yeah, Lauren's online. This is again to accept a recommendation uh, from the ethics committee to approve Lauren's uh, research application, evaluating the success of relocating freshwater mussel species at risk as a form of conservation and focusing on efforts within Southern Ontario. So with that being said, scan out Sago and welcome Lauren. I'll give you uh, just again, a high level overview if you could give us uh, as counsel uh, to your research application uh, and if there's any further questions or comments, and then from there, we'll look to a decision point. So welcome uh, to general counsel this evening. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I do have a slideshow that I can share with everyone. Sure. And again, just uh, I do have a, a few other uh, delegations. So I'm gonna have a time limit if I can uh, on your uh, on the this presentation. So we'll give it uh, roughly about 10 minutes. Now. Yeah. Okay, awesome. We'll, I'll move quickly. Um, so just beforehand, uh, before I get started, thank you for introducing me. And I just wanted to um, say thank you again for the opportunity to speak here in this meeting today. Uh, my name is Lauren Danfus. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Healthy Headwaters Lab out of the University of Windsor. And I'm a French descended settler. And my family and I call Turtle Island home. Um, within the lab, I work under Dr. Catherine Fabria, who is also here on the call today. And our work at Healthy Headwaters, which is guided by CAT, um, focuses on reconnecting land, water, and people uh, through working together to find local solutions to environmental issues. Oh, sorry. Okay. So as part of that larger work, I'll be presenting my research project, which is asking a larger question, does radiation achieve conservation, specifically in regard to translocating freshwater mussel species at risk in southwestern Ontario? Uh, but before I get into my project itself, I just want to give you a bit of background on the process that's brought me to this point in my research today. So there's been a lot of growth for myself and the project since I began. Uh, the concept for this research was proposed in 2020 and is funded by Dufferin Construction. I began on the project in fall of 2021 as a master's student, and that's when I began to formulate my plan for the research. And it actually, it actually wasn't until early 2022 that we received reports documenting past translocations of freshwater mussels, and that would form the basis of the rest of my project. 
But before receiving these reports, we actually had no clue of where the majority of these translocations had taken place, but it was soon discovered that the majority of these events had actually occurred in the Grand River. Um, I then conducted fieldwork at a number of sites of previous translocations um, and sites that in the Grand River in 2022 that I now know is Six Nations territory. And I brought this up in my ethics application as well, but I just wanted to take a moment here to apologize for doing that without receiving permission. If there's any interest in the data gathered from those surveys, I would be more than happy to provide it in whatever form is most useful to the Six Nations community. And also, my project is not actually the first one from our lab to be brought to Six Nations for ethics approval. You may remember my colleague and fellow PhD student, Shannon Nolan, was approved to continue her work, which was titled Stream Health Across a Human Impacted Landscape in fall of 2022. And I then made the decision uh, earlier this year to expand my project into a PhD. And it's just really important to me that I have it move forward in the best way possible. And this intention has brought me to the ethics approval process uh, which included the rec uh, a recorded demonstration I did earlier this spring at Mill Pond that some of you have possibly seen. So now I'll briefly introduce you to the organism at the center of my study. As you may or may not know, freshwater mussels, also known as Unionidae, are incredibly important and beneficial to our freshwater ecosystems and are not to be confused with introduced species of mussels, such as the zebra mussels currently affecting the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, they are also extremely threatened, and because they are largely immobile, they have an increased vulnerability to infrastructure activities. And this, among other reasons, is resulting in rapid population decline and an increasing number of mussel species labeled as species at risk of extinction, uh, also known as SAR. So freshwater mussels experience a number of relationships within their environment, just a couple of which I'll be getting into here. Their communities are composed of multiple mussel species and they burrow into the actual substrate of the riverbed where they exist amongst benthic macroinvertebrates, which are essentially bugs that live on the bottom of the stream. And also key to the mussel communities are host fish, which are actually vital to the majority of freshwater mussel reproduction. And due to their reliance on community interactions, freshwater mussels depend on the health of their habitats and are actually a model system for restoration efforts. So the relationship between benthid macroinvertebrates and freshwater mussels is important for a number of reasons. Freshwater mussels provide resources and improve habitat for benthid macroinvertebrates. And because benthid macroinvertebrates thrive amongst established mussel communities, mussel community health can be indicated by benthid macroinvertebrate diversity. And furthermore, recent research has shown that specific macroinvertebrate taxa can be indicators for certain freshwater mussels are. But for now, just a bit more on that species at risk designation. Uh, when a species is determined to be at risk of extinction, it's placed into one of these four categories that you see here. Uh, this is referred to what we know to be the Species at Risk Act, which is also known as SARA. Freshwater mussels are not only protected under this designation system, but they're also the only invertebrates protected under the Fisheries Act. Um, and therefore DFO, um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, is the primary authority in regard to SAR mussel conservation. So at present, mussel SAR conservation exists largely in the form of translocations. And translocations are currently required by DFO when a freshwater mussel SAR is determined to be at a site of a future infrastructure project. Translocations are performed by local um, environmental consultancies hired by the engineering firms undertaking the construction. And all translocations in Canada are completed following what I'll be referring to as the Mackey Protocol that you see to your right here. And it's the only federally published protocol for this procedure, and it actually hasn't been updated since its publication in 2008. So where in Canada is the majority of these translocations happening? Uh, well, as we all know, Southern Ontario is experiencing very rapid rates of development. Uh, however, this area also contains crucial mussel habitat. It supports 40, actually 41 of Canada's 54 species of freshwater mussels. And within that number, 16 are considered to be at risk of extinction. And therefore the majority of these in-water infrastructure projects in this area often require a translocation, to relocate species at risk individuals in those communities. So a translocation effort that will definitely be familiar to everyone here is the one that occurred at the Argyle Bridge in 2020, which was completed by the environmental consulting firm NRSI. Uh, this is a photo of that site facing upstream towards the dam. 
And this was actually the largest translocation to ever occur in Ontario and most likely Canada. And by its completion, over 160,000 mussels were translocated, which included six species at risk and 22 species total. So I'm just really going to quickly outline the translocation process here just to save us some time. But initially there's a prescribed search area that's established. That's any of the area that would be negatively impacted by that infrastructure project or by that construction in general. All of the mussels in that within that prescribed search area are collected and they're moved upstream to a relocation site, which has been chosen visually for similar habitat by that environmental consulting firm. A control site upstream of that relocation site is sometimes established as well. It depends uh, for future surveys, but those surveys are then performed at one month, one year, and two years following that initial translocation. And all of them require a report that is then submitted to DFO. And I've actually received 78 of those reports that have been provided to me by DFO, as well as NRSI, as I previously mentioned, um, one of those environmental consulting firms performing these translocations. So what has been witnessed from those reports that we've looked at so far? In 2013, a preliminary study performed by the Freshwater Mussel SAR team at DFO revealed an issue across translocations regionally. There's actually a diminishing rate of return when it comes to mussel recovery. Mussels are actually disappearing from that relocation site, but the cause is unknown. And that's starting with an average of only 50% recovery during the one month survey. And that drops to just 20% of those original tag mussels found by two years post translocation. In the time since that research though, there's actually been little to no advancement in understanding those findings. So 10 years later, what we're coming back to is this an effective form of mitigation and is mitigation resulting in conservation? So there's actually four key knowledge gaps that we're looking into here. Uh, a lack of evaluation of the muscle SAR response to translocation, no assessment of the overall translocated muscle response, um, a failure to discern or know if the original habitat is eventually recovering, and no actual knowledge of the effect of translocations on that benthic macroinvertebrate community. So to put it more broadly, I'm working to try and identify the conservation success of these translocations being performed and if we can make recommendations to actually improve the MACI protocol that I referenced earlier. And we can break that down into three key sections, uh, first of which being the synthesis of those translocation reports provided by DFO and NRSI, which allows evaluation of how those translocations are being performed. Then my own 2022 field surveys at a number of sites of previous translocations. And then finally, an analysis of those combined findings. So the initial synthesis of those 78 reports I mentioned earlier involved gathering all of the data, qualitative and quantitative, um, that we could. The majority of the 23 translocations documented within those reports were performed in Ontario uh, by a variety of consulting firms. These translocations were performed over a large span of time, the earliest being 2006, the most current happening as recently as 2020, and there was also really high variability to the translocations themselves. Some involved smaller communities, like approximately 10 mussels, and then others were much, much larger, like that Argyle Bridge effort I just mentioned, where translocation populations were in the thousands. So the results from that synthesis, uh, I'll be showing you here. The diagonal stripes you see at the top reflect muscles that they failed to locate. Gray represents previously tagged muscles found alive and black represents documented mortality. And you can see here that the largest decline in retrieval happens just one month following the initial translocation, then continues to slowly decline in the years following, averaging at just 20% of original muscles found by two years following that translocation. And this is really similar to the findings by DFO that I mentioned earlier. And not surprisingly, the number of species at each site was also found to decrease over this two year period with almost 40% of original species absent during that two year survey. Also through the synthesis of those translocation reports, we were able to map sites of previous translocations. So many of those events within, occurred within the same or adjacent watersheds and spanned 14 years. And through that, we were able to choose sites in a space for time gradient that would then provide insight into habitat and community recovery in the years following that translocation. And then through this gradient, eight sites specifically were selected in Southern Ontario for those 2022 field surveys. And for those chosen locations, uh, we performed identical surveys at the relocation site and the, the original prescribed search area. Um, 
And this included benthic macroinvertebrate collection following OBBN protocol, uh, water sampling and the measurement of several stream and site characteristics, and timed and quadrat muscle searches, which provides insight into species presence as well as abundance. And the preliminary results of field sampling were actually very surprising. Out of the eight sites we surveyed, one site was actually completely absent of mussels, and two other sites actually had no mussels present at the original relocation site. In addition, through all of our sampling, we actually located only one mussel that was tagged from the previous translocation, a translocation which in this instance had occurred in 2013, and it was a wavy rayed lamp mussel, which is a species at risk. So now I'll just show you my combined analysis of the report syntheses and our preliminary field survey findings. If there was a recovery process across sites in the time following translocation, we would witness populations slowly return to sizes similar to those pre-translocation, pre which would look something like this graph that you see here. Uh, each dot on this graph represents a previous translocation and their distance from the Y axis indicates how long ago that translocation event occurred. Instead, what we actually witnessed was decreasing populations across sites. And as you can see here, it appears that populations continue to decline in the 15 years following the translocation, instead of returning to their previous state in that time period. And while I'm currently representing that pattern with a straight line, further analysis will determine if there's maybe a more complicated nature of that lack of recovery. And during those 2022 surveys, populations were on average only 21.6% of their original size. And just briefly looking at the species, uh, during those 2022 surveys, we actually found two species documented at sites they weren't identified at during the initial translocation uh, that you see to your left here. And fortunately, however, there are also five species that we failed to locate at more than one site in 2022 where they had existed previously. And this actually included two species at risk, the wavy ray lamp mussel and the rainbow mussel. So to continue to try and understand what could be explaining this really poor recovery of these muscle communities, we're going to look to remaining data. Uh, that's our sampled benthic macroinvertebrate communities, um, the continued analysis of measured environmental variables across and within sites, and that includes um, water quality uh, and different other variables that we've measured. And from these data sets, I'll be able to gain greater insight into the broader effect of translocations and begin to explain why the expected recovery isn't actually occurring. So in addition, I actually really recently transferred from the master's program into a PhD, as I mentioned above. And the first step of that process includes performing an excavation of a healthy muscle community to perform our own translocation in the Sydenham River this summer. And we're actually going to be pit tagging several of the muscles and monitoring them really closely to try and decipher where the majority of these muscles are going post translocation and what percentage can be contributed to migratory behavior. Just from these preliminary findings, however, there are also there are already many recommendations that can be made to probably or definitely improve the translocation process. Um, and this includes recommendations to government, those environmental consulting firms and conservation practitioners. And um, something I spoke briefly about with uh, Julia Zazzarini after my demonstration in May, and what I would love to propose to the Six Nations community is hearing your thoughts on what could improve freshwater mussel species at risk translocations. And I just really want to stress the openness and the flexibility of that invitation. Oh, sorry. this could be um, collaborative, or I'd just be more than happy to just offer you my data. Um, the level of involvement and how you think it could best serve Six Nations is entirely up to you. Sorry, I'm wrapping up really quick here. I have one more slide. Um, something that we're in the early stages of planning, and I'm personally really excited about, uh, is a day for Six Nations community members to possibly come out to the Grand River for muscling with our lab. Uh, this day can be super casual and involve just learning how to look for and identify species of mussels, or it can be more in depth and teach the basics of stream monitoring. We've previously done events similar to this with youth from ages like 13 to 20 from the Kejuanong, and they had a great time spending the afternoon in the stream and learning about all of the varieties of mussel species in their watershed. Um, and thank you so much. I'm sorry, I, I hope I didn't take too much time. Okay, now so much, Lauren. Uh, so informative and a lot of information uh, within your presentation. So do appreciate you uh, walking us through that. Uh, really exciting. I know I like how uh, you're you're going to uh, do the muscling day. I think that might uh, you know if we could work with our comms, 
um, in different organizations to see if there's any other further interest of our young people. I know there's uh, summer camps wrapping up and so forth, and maybe some were not able to get into some. So maybe this is an opportunity to further get uh, engaged uh, and especially uh, on our Grand River. So I do appreciate uh, that as well. I'm gonna open the floor up for further questions and comments first, uh, beginning with Audrey. Audrey, you have the floor. Yeah, hello, Mark. <clears throat> that was a, a very good presentation. I was really interested in it. Yes, we want the data. And um, <clears throat> is it possible to move those mussels back to their original habitat to see if that could be a successful growth? And I've got two, three other ones. I um, think, oh, sorry. Oh, I'll let you finish first and then I'll answer. Okay, the next one is, uh, there should be other methods of translocation that can be used and documented so you can see which ones uh, uh, work better for certain types of muscle. And I guess that you are studying to find out why the muscles fail to thrive. And that would be the important thing because then you have to make sure those conditions are, are available for your new translocation. And maybe one thing, those mussels dig themselves into the into the ground of the water, right? So maybe more of their habitat could be taken so that it's undisturbed when you translocate it to the new area. Those are my questions. <laughs> Those are very good questions. Um, so for the first one, they actually have, there's been some instances where they will remove the mussels from the site. They'll perform all the infrastructure and then they'll place the mussels back. But I think the question is for most likely the environmental consulting firms is where to keep those muscles in the meantime. I think a lot of those uh, construction projects can go on for a really extended period of time. So they need somewhere where they can keep the muscles in the meantime. And then you also need someone who is very willing to restore that habitat where that infrastructure happened and make sure that it's as equally, um, it's, it's as, as good of quality or better for those muscles when we put them back at those sites. Um, what was your second question? Sorry. Oh, you're on mute. Regular Tuesday. <laughs> Other methods of translocation and trying to find out and determine why muscles, certain muscles, maybe it's not all, you've got some who are surviving. What's so good that those ones are surviving? So there what, are... There's, yeah, there's there's no real other methods of translocation at the moment. That's why I think it's important that this project happens and hopefully we come up with some alternative methods that are less stressful to the muscle communities as a whole. And I think why you're seeing some muscles survive and, and repopulate more than others is that some are just way more resilient. Like you have your really, really resilient species, which can we usually live to be very old and can survive all kinds of different habitat quality. But then you have your species, which are more commonly your species at risk, these smaller muscles, which are more immediately impacted by negative habitat changes or pollution. And I think those are the first ones that with that added st stress of translocation, they're the first to not survive or, or do well at those uh, relocation sites. And the last one was the scooping up of more of their habitat to take with them when you translocate them. Would that work? You should have written my proposal with me, Audrey. <laughs> um, so that's why we're actually curious about that because- Lauren, the, think about the, invet, the inverts as well, the, bent, the the sediment and the inverts, which is one of the that, that data point and that we have for other, site, other sites. Yes, I was just going to say that the muscles and the inverts have that really special relationship with one another. So we're actually wondering if by moving, moving the inverts with the muscle species, it's easier for them to repopulate that new site and less stressful to the community as a whole. Because we are really, really disturbing that the freshwater muscle community and just the aquatic community as a whole by moving those muscles upstream without any of the surrounding benthic macroinvertebrates. Yeah, they love their habitat, move their habitat with them. Yeah. Yeah, and we and we found that where they remove where they move them to, they don't look for the same habitat or inverts. So that's something Lauren's adding in the analysis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like they're just currently visually looking at the habitat and they're not actually 
quantifying that search to make sure that the habitat actually appropriate that we're choosing to move them to. Okay, now so much uh, really good questions. Audrey, Audrey may have to join you on at Muscle Day at Six Nations. <laughs> Thank you so much, Audrey. Yes. <laughs> Just really quickly on that note, Lauren, if I could ask you to put your contact information in the chat um, and uh, so that our comms, our comms lady is on this evening, Caitlin, she'd like to do some reach out just to uh, get some further communication out to the community and maybe build some more interest uh, within our community. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, I see a couple more hands raised. I'm going to first uh, go over to Greg and then Michelle. Greg, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. It was a nice presentation. Um, yeah, because it overall, um, I guess the take home message is that the translocations were not that successful um, overall. The, um, the thing is, is that do you do any uh, toxicity or any postmortem on muscles that did not survive? So what our current issue is, is that we're not actually finding those muscles that have that have possibly suffered mortality. So when they're going back to those sites, they're just not finding the muscles in general. And that means those muscles could be dying and then being washed downstream um, after they pass away, or they're being predated upon and um, by raccoons or muskrats or any other natural predators, or they're actually moving way downstream. So unfortunately we can't perform any postmortems, but I'm hoping with that pit tagging uh, translocation that we're gonna be performing later in the summer in the Sydenham River, uh, that we can actually see if those muscles are in fact dying and and getting moved downstream by just like the flow of the river or if something else is is happening if they're moving downstream on their own accord if they're being predated at the spot we're moving them to yeah so we'll hopefully we'll answer that question great thank you yeah yeah for that uh, great over to you michelle great to see you again lauren um so i've heard the presentation before and the committee's asked those questions, so I'm going to move. Okay, do appreciate that. Thank you, um, Nyala Michelle. It's moved by Michelle, seconded by Audrey, uh, to again approve Lauren's application. Um, looking to any further questions or comments to the motion. Again, do want to uh, uh, recognize Dr. Catherine as well. I know she's been having some issues with her picture, but or her uh, visual, but do want to uh, acknowledge her as well. Okay, that being said, I, I'm not seeing any further questions or comments to the motion. Again, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. A motion to waive second reading. Moved by Michelle, seconded by Audrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Okay, well, thank you again, Anyawa, Lauren, uh, and as well as Dr. Catherine for joining us this evening. A really informative um, presentation, if, if you can. I know Caitlin will probably be reaching out just to kind of get more information to see how we can build further interest on the day that you're planning at Six Nations. Uh, so do appreciate again, and congratulations on your work. And again, Nyawa. Thank you so, so, so much. Have, Have a, a great, great night, everyone. Okay, Council, we're continuing moving along here on our delegation portion of the agenda. Then our next delegation is Sheba, uh, Shelley, Shebra, I don't know, I'm going to say Shelley T, uh, who is part of uh, research and consulting on the National Outcome Based Framework. I believe we have Shelley online uh, right now who's sharing her screen. So welcome uh, and good evening, uh, Shelley. We do have another guest after you as well. Um, so I will uh, look uh, to uh, allotting roughly about 10, 15 minutes for your presentation and get into any further questions or comments. So with that being said, again, I want to say scan out Sago and welcome to you, Shelly, and I'll pass the floor over to yourself. Great. Thanks very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Nyawa. And can you see the uh, screen that I'm sharing as well? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for um taking the time to uh, listen to the presentation. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm attending this meeting from the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. So I'm, I'm in, in Ottawa. Um, I'm um, a consultant working with Indigenous Services Canada, um, the Joint Advisory Committee on New Fiscal Relations and um, the AFN. Um, and we are um, working on the development um, of a, a national outcome-based framework 
Um, it's still in the uh, conceptual stages. Um, and we've been um, doing some work on it over um, a, a few years, um, trying to develop the idea of the framework um, and have been reaching out to um, some First Nations leaders, um, uh, program experts, um, community development um, um, experts, uh, data experts, et cetera, to try to start talking about this idea. Um, I, I've worked um, on this, like I said, for the last couple of years. Um, prior to that, I was the executive director of the Indian Residential Schools Adjudication Secretariat and had a pleasure of uh, coming to uh, Six Nations uh, a few years ago and uh, um, spent about a week there um, working, with, working with some of the survivors. Um, also, um, have done uh, quite a bit of work recently on the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, um, portfolio. Um, I was involved in developing the National Action Plan a couple of years ago and the first progress report um, uh, two years ago. Um, so what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes just walking through um, the deck just to give you a sense of what this concept of the National Outcome-Based Framework is. Um, and, and I'm hoping at some point um, potentially to get your input um, on the goal and purpose of the National Outcome-Based Framework, uh, the themes that we're utilizing and the image, um, and um, your, your ideas on reporting and ongoing management should this uh, go forward. Um, so I'll just um, quickly go through, I believe um, you all have access to the deck and some other documents that I provided. If you don't, let me know and I can certainly provide them as well um, following the meeting. Um, so the National Outcome-Based Framework, the idea of it is it is meant to uh, measure and report on the socioeconomic well-being of First Nations people and the progress towards closure of the gaps. It's meant to be a national level framework. Um, uh, it, it, of course, will include breakdowns by region, on off reserve, gender, age, etc. But it's not meant to replace uh, First Nations community based frameworks or plans that are already in place. Um, we assume and um, think there are commonalities because this framework is actually built upon what we've learned from the community based frameworks. Um, but obviously, every First Nation has certain priorities and areas that they're going to be focusing on. So would have so, uh, just some different indicators, but we assume that there are going to be some that are similar. Um, it's meant to be a small number of indicators um, as per uh, principles identified by the Joint Advisory Committee on Fiscal Relations. It's not meant to cover every single indicator uh, possible, but a few key indicators. But it's meant also to be broad um, and include uh, various areas um, that are important to First Nations people. Um, it's meant to be a, a mechanism of mutual accountability to secure sufficient, predictable, and sustained funding for First Nations um, by looking at where the gaps are and where um, we should be focusing some of the priorities um, and money. Um, but I guess also importantly, it's um, not meant to increase respondent burden for First Nations communities. So at this point, utilizing existing data sources, knowing that there are still a lot of um, areas where data are not very good or not sufficient, and also trying to identify where we could try to improve uh, the data that's available. Um, the intent of reporting on this would be to tell the realities um, of First Nations communities, including their unique strengths, challenges, and barriers to access. Um, so a report the idea would be there would be an ongoing uh, report, probably published every couple of years, that talks about the socioeconomic gaps with breakdowns, but importantly also would talk about the context. So what are the limitations of the indicators and the data? What are the interconnections between themes such as education impacting on uh, employment, for instance? Um, discuss additional data or research that may not be available at a national level, but may be available elsewhere. And also, I think importantly, talk about the reasons for the gaps. So are there barriers to access? Um, and what are the initiatives and activities underway to try to close the gaps? Um, and discussions underway as to who would release this report and how often, uh, what sort of themes the, the report should focus on. And I think really importantly, who should have ongoing responsibility for development of the framework uh, and how development should occur over time. 
Uh, just to show you that there's been um, many calls for the development of an outcome-based framework as far back and I'm sure further back than the RCAP, um, some AGM resolutions, um, the Joint Advisory Committee, the Auditor General of Canada and others. Um, and to show you a bit of how this has been developed so far, uh, the very first thing that was done was to develop some guiding principles as to what this idea of a national outcome based framework should be. Um, and similar to some of the things I've already mentioned, the idea is that it's meant to align with a First Nations worldview, um, that there would be a small number of um, indicators um, so that there wouldn't be uh, undue data collection burden, burden. Um, and that the um, the framework itself would be evergreen and could be reviewed and improved on over time. The next step um, in developing the idea was to learn from First Nations well-being frameworks and plans. So we went out and uh, did a scan across Canada. Um, this was back in probably 2019 with a refresh in 2021 um, of what First Nations plans were in place and uh, drew up on those. Um, I, I'll note, of course, that Six Nations has a pretty robust community development plan, which was one of the ones that we've uh, learned from. And from that, we um, identified some of the major themes. And you can see from that um, areas such as health and wellness, culture and language, education and economy uh, were some of the, the, the main ones that uh, were in the frameworks, um, as well as some of the other areas identified here. So we'd looked at that point about 169 communities and uh, identified about 94 frameworks or plans that were in place at that point. From that, we developed the first uh, version of the framework, which is this one on the left. You can see we have governance as an overarching theme. Um, at this point, about eight different um, themes, um, and they were meant to flow into one another. Uh, and some of the initial engagement we did was on this uh, initial graphic of the framework. Following from that, we, we also, of course, um, worked extensively with the First Nations Information Governance Center, with Statistics Canada, uh, with academics, looked at international frameworks and others to try to see where there was alignment. Uh, also the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, and the MMIWG, UN DRIP, et cetera. And then we did three streams of engagement. One was with uh, First Nations and government program experts. Uh, the second was engagement with First Nations leaders, and that was done through FNIGC. Um, unfortunately, that one uh, started and, and there was about five or six sessions, um, but then when COVID hit, it was put on hold. So we didn't feel like there was sufficient engagement there, which is part of the reason why we're doing additional engagement. And then the third stream was engagement with First Nations and other data experts. And we've got uh, reports on all of those if people are interested in seeing uh, what we learned from, from those, as well as the First Nations Wellbeing Frameworks and Plans. We've got a report on it. Based on that, we uh, developed um, the second framework. Um, you can see here what we heard from the engagement was the importance of having the individual in the center of this framework, um, surrounded by and supported by the community. Um, other things were that it was suggested that environment and land become overarching themes as well. And then this third um, framework, you can see this graphic is um, another rendering of it. Uh, we'd hired a First Nations graphic artist to uh, try to uh, improve upon um, what we had developed. And so this is the current framework as it stands. Um, and you can see, I will just jump down quickly. The actual graphic um, is, and some of the um, indicators that we have, um, for instance, under um, economic prosperity, uh, things like employment, low income, uh, First Nations owned businesses, uh, housing and, and community, things like overcrowding, uh, use of internet, et cetera. And this is where we're at now is we st we've started doing additional engagement with um, uh, 
uh, First Nations leaders, with uh, tribal councils, um, with ind Indigenous regional organizations as well, to try to um, provide information on what this concept is. And I think importantly, try to uh, hear from people whether the goal of it and the purpose and the themes um, um, sound right to people to try to get better in input from everyone. Um, following from that, we will um, uh, redevelop it, uh, assuming that people think it's it makes sense to do, um, validate it uh, with First Nations experts and move forward to get approval. Uh, with the idea being that it will be an evergreen framework and improved upon over time. And I will just show you one other thing that we did as well. We tried to look at um, alignment with uh, First Nations, uh, with, with various inquiries and commissions. And you can see um, there's very good alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the UN DRIP, the TRC, and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, um, as well as a lot of other ones that we've looked at. So as I mentioned, um, what we would hope to to get at some point uh, from you um, is um, your comments on the goal of developing this national level outcome-based framework um, the, with the stated purpose, which is to measure uh, progress towards closure of the socio socioeconomic gaps, um, whether the themes are um, encompass uh, priority areas for you and uh, the visual image, whether it speaks to you um, and, in, and comments on the, uh, the idea of a proposed report and ongoing development of the framework. I know that was very quick, um, but hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're trying to do. Well, thank you, uh, Nyala, for that. Uh, Shelly, if I can ask if you can just uh, stop your share screen. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions and comments on this one. And I, I'd like to be, begin first before I head over to, to Nathan, Councillor Nathan, who has his hand raised. Uh, first. First off, uh, I hope this isn't seen as consultation, and I'm glad to see that you're at least going and following our process of uh, what it looks like uh, for us at, here at Six Nations and, and getting approval to do this type of work. The trouble I have with these types of um, conversations is we can do all the reports. Canada can do all the reports they want. They can do all the frameworks they want, but it doesn't mean nothing. I mean, a lot of these times they sit up on the shelves, they collect it. I mean, you'll get your consulting fee, which is good, but our nations will still suffer. And I think that's something where I always uh, get very frustrated with because at the end of the day, say for example, we know what we need. If, if out of the realities of, of, of First Nations people, it, it should be coming directly from First Nations people because we live it on a daily basis. And one of those pieces is that we, for example, we know what we need we request and we request and we, we, we look to applications through government, we, we, we refine them, we retune them, we look to their, again, how we further it and we still get denied. Like say, for example, the biggest one is our language school, Gawaniel School, who we've constantly have been working with the government to look at applications and look at different frameworks and reports and much like what you've laid out. And at the end of the day, we're still getting denied. So uh, for me, it's 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 troubling and frustrating when we have to go through this type of, and even yourself, to come to our community and to access or look for access of this information and further conversation and discussion points, because at the end of the day, I don't think they truly mean anything. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's nice to have the information, but what is that information truly used for? Because it's not for approving projects at Six Nations. That's what I feel like at this point in time. I mean, we've always looked to the relationship and furthering. I mean, you're, we're really talking on a framework across the board from health, social, education, employment, land, environment, the list goes on. And so that's something that for me, we still are having trouble even with the, the terminology co-development. I mean, it's something that has always been um, raised as yes, we're, we're co-partners within solutions but at the end of the day, again, I don't feel like we are because the, the mandate is already pre-written prior to even becoming a coal anything. <laughs> so for me, that's part of the struggles that I have with this presentation. I'm sure counselors uh, will uh, share their thoughts as well. And at this point in time, I'll open those thoughts uh, for further questions and deliberation. Uh, I'm gonna first begin with Nathan over to Greg and then Audrey. Nathan, you have the floor. Yeah. Thanks, Chief, and, and thanks, Shelley, for the presentation. Uh, Chief, you, you, you um, 
your your comments really reflect what where I was going to go with a lot of this because um, I have uh, a lot more questions that than and concerns than um, than anything uh, kind of constructive at this point. Uh, the first thing is is it would be my advice to council that we not comment on this um, beyond um, kind of our initial reactions. Um, only for for the point that you just raised, Chief, it, it's not consultation. But it always happens in First Nations lands. We say we're not going to be consulted, and then we give our opinion. Right. So <laughs> I'm going to try to restrain myself in terms of this particular. Um, um, but the one thing I just wanted to kind of, um, I guess, illuminate and and what would be helpful is for this particular initiative, who pays the bill at the end of the day? You, you mentioned you had a number of partners and AFN is involved and ESC is involved. And, and uh, I thought you, you also may have mentioned that FNIGC was involved at one point with some sort of engagement. I'm assuming ISC is the, the lead on this is, and really it goes back to the chief in terms of the, the, the purpose of this. Um, when when you look down at it and, and you have the Auditor General uh, who does uh, an enormous amount of work for, for Canadians, um, that Auditor General already signaling that, you know, there's an overburden and, and First Nations are, are, are overreported time and time again. Um, it's it's troubling to hear that there's there's going to be this kind of new approach and and quote unquote um, kind of uh, new kind of way to to look at um, how the information is collected for us and how is makes decisions um, you know outcome based you know there's a number of ways you can inter interpret outcome based and and outcome based really does mean if you're not producing an outcome that is likes. You're not going to get funded, and that's the classic kind of approach. It, it's just you know putting uh, new bells and whistles and a new paint job on on the typical approach uh, that that is takes. So it, it is troubling and, and something at, at this level. Uh, I would think uh, you know First Nations get uh, afforded a number of resources uh, to do this particular work at the community level. You know, I've always been kind of a proponent of First Nations getting the resources to do our own work, but um, we're not there yet. So uh, I'll leave my comments there, um, just uh, to the point that, you know, I don't think we're prepared to comment any further on some of those pieces. And uh, yeah, it's, it seems like a bit of a shell game to start off with in terms of this particular initiative. Okay, now for your comments uh, as well, uh, Nathan, I'm going to continue going down the speaker's queue. Uh, next up is Greg. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Shelley, for uh, the presentation. Um, I, I agree with, uh, with Nathan and, and the chief on this point. Um, we see these words, we see these studies to develop, we see frameworks, we see consultations, we see task force. But it takes sometimes years to get the information, and then it takes even another government to see if they're going to act on it. the The thing that bothers me is that the differences in federal funding and transfer of funds, uh, even from at the provincial level, these differences respect to funding to First Nation communities versus non First Nation communities, to me, is discriminatory. It is. It's discriminate. It's been this way for uh, forever, and and that's the way we see it. That it, it's a discriminatory practice. And again, um, as far as comments and opinions taken back, um, I cannot I cannot give any at this point. So again, um, I agree with uh, Nathan and the chief um, that uh, it's. It's always the same. It, it appears to be always the same with uh, similar results. And uh, I think that's that's as far as I could go on for, in terms of my comments. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, Greg, as well. Again, just gonna continue moving along uh, who I have on has their hand raised. Next up is Audrey, Councillor Audrey. Yeah, well, Mark. I agree with my colleagues who, who just spoke. In fact, Mark said exactly what I, I was, uh, leaning towards. Uh, yes, we do want the data from you. And I, I'd like to note, see what, uh, who 
responded of which First Nations in Canada. I'd like to know what the time frame is on this. And I would also, like you say, it's uh, co-developed. Well, it looks like it's a pretty well baked cake right now. And you're asking us to comment on the goals that you set. We didn't co-develop those goals. And uh, how to measure it and close the gaps in socioeconomic, um, the gaps that are, are present. But that is gonna take our entire uh, reserve to do this. All of our programs, it's gonna take person hours. It's going to take um, a lot of work to get that documentation done. Like we've been trying to do this for a, a while now. So I think just to come in here at the last moment and ask for this is unrealistic. And I agree that we have to uh, do it at the time of Six Nations. We are sovereign and we will do this probably work for, for us. And uh, the chief and council will decide uh, what to do after that. But now for the presentation. Now, uh, now Audrey, for your comments as well. Uh, next up, I have Councillor Michelle. And I'm not going to repeat, but uh, Chief, you did, you know, speak quite well on the topic. Um, and I think, and I, I want community to know that we are actually looking at doing this ourselves, right? This is exactly the vision of the community plan and what we have going. So, um, you know, Six Nations is well above than, uh, well on its way of doing this. Okay, now, now with that, Michelle as well. So, uh, Shelly, again, as as you could probably see, it's. I hope you didn't take this as uh, further, uh, you know, um, any disrespect, because that's not what we're trying to do here. It's it's really just the frustration of the realities that our people live in, um, and I think it's something that you know we can have all the reports and the frameworks that we want. What I think we need, and what like maybe the big message for Shelly yourself as as a hired uh, consultant to take back is to maybe tell the government to have the true political will to do the right thing. I think that's what we're missing. We don't need any more further reports and frameworks and further to that. We actually need the actual true political will to do the right thing. And I think that's something that we've been entirely uh, trying to work towards in conjunction with um, you know, the government at times, but it, it falls on deaf ears. And that's the frustration that we have within our community at least. I know there's others uh, that have that same frustration, but I think at the end of the day, um, it's coming to a point of, we'll, we'll have to do what we have to do for our people. Because again, as long as we're getting denial letters left and right, our people are still suffering. So at this point in time, Shelley, I don't think we're prepared to move on any motion. Uh, I think again, we'll, uh, I don't even think we'll, uh, pre we're prepared to take this and accept it as information, if anything. We uh, are prepared, I believe, in a sense of looking at this as not consultation um, and that we will look to our next step at Six Nations and inform uh, the uh, ISC office what that looks like. I think. Um, can I take a second to just re respond to a couple of questions or a couple of comments? Thank 100%. you. Yeah, so appreciate all of the, the comments that you received and want to make it clear that this was not meant to be a consultation for sure. Um, this was meant that there's been work done on this idea. AFN and the Joint Advisory Committee on New Fiscal Relations and ISC have, have um, been responding to the OAG's um, call for a national outcome-based framework like this. So there's been some initial work done, but this is by no means something that's set. And um, if in the end, uh, if people are saying they don't want to see something like this, it may not move forward at all. So I don't want anyone to feel um, that, that that's what we're trying to do is say, here you go, is this, is this good or not? Um, we're trying to get initial ideas. Um, the reason some of it has moved along was during COVID, there wasn't the, the work going on with First Nations leaders, which should have happened back in 2019. Um, so just want to make sure that that part of it's clear and really appreciate your comments on this. Um, the um, concept, uh, there was a question about who's um, paying the bill for it. So um, Indigenous Services Canada um, has been working closely with the AFN on it. The Joint Advisory Committee um, is the one that in their report that said that we should be moving forward on developing this. And the MOU with um, the AFN and, uh, and the Prime Minister at the time um, called for the development of these. It is a national outcome framework. Like I said, it's not meant to replace 
by any means the the uh, community development frameworks and i know six nations has has a really impressive one that's one that we actually had built a lot upon so i'm happy to hear your comments i mean my role is to take back people's comments on this so don't i i take no offense to anything that you've said and i understand um, I've been working in this area for a long time. I, I know the realities of, of the issues. So I'm happy to take the comments that you provide and um, send them and, and bring them back upwards. Um, and in terms of um, the reports, I'll send those off um, uh, to you as well. So you can see what, what this um, has been built on to date. Uh, now for that, uh, Shelley, I do see Audrey has her hand raised uh, as well. A couple of points, uh, Shelley. Uh, AFN does not speak for us, so yes. you can meet with them all day long. They're still not speaking for us. If you want to speak to Six Nations, you come here like you're doing now at the beginning. Not well, <laughs> things are um, almost done. And the other thing that I have a little concern with is uh, the word, term that you use talking to us as you people. Okay, That's I'm sorry. To me. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it in that way. And, yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I understand uh, certainly that AFN doesn't speak for uh, other First Nations. Okay, well, thank you, Nyala, again, uh, Shelley, for, for coming in front of us uh, this evening. Uh, we will look to, again, uh, discuss this internally in terms of what our next best steps are for us here at Six Nations. And do appreciate Audrey's comments. Like, yes, she is entirely correct. Correct. Uh, in, in saying that the AFN does not, Six Nations has always spoke for Six Nations and we continuously will. And as you can see with our work that we've done, and I, obviously it's been a, maybe a, a part of helping this work, like our, say for example, our community plan, um, maybe maybe that's where we'll send our bill to you next. <laughs> <laughs> so do appreciate all, all your yourself coming in front of council this evening. Um, and we will look to our next best steps on this matter. Thank you very much. Have a great yeah, day. Have a great evening. Bye. Okay, Council, we're continuing moving along here. We do have one more delegation this evening. Um, this uh, guest is uh, from the Six Nations Anti-Bullying Task Force, Jen Mount Pleasant. You'll see that there's a recommendation uh, on your agendas. Again, this is to provide an update as to the work that's been happening uh, from uh, the task force, the anti-bullying task force itself. So with that being said, I want to say scan out, say go, and welcome uh, Jen Mount Pleasant. At this point in time, I'll pass the floor uh, over to Jen uh, to walk us through her updates. So good evening, Jen. Oh, sorry, Jen, you'll have to, um, you'll have to, uh, fix your audio. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yes, now we can hear you fine. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to come before General Council in the open session today to do a community update, um, which is pretty much our first update. So there is uh, a little bit of information to get to go through. I am mindful that um, mindful of the time as well. So I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. While I'm <clears throat> talking, um, I just want it to let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, there's a, we're doing a community survey at the moment, and this is a, a QR code. If you are able to scan that and fill out the survey while I'm doing the community update, we're giving out as an incentive our anti-bullying t-shirts. Um, there's also, if you're not able to scan the QR code, the uh, link for the survey is at the top, so you could just type that into your browser. So <clears throat> there's seven uh, points that I want to get through uh, this evening. And it's mostly about what the task force is all about because we're still getting contacted by community members who are saying that, you know, I just found out that, the, that there is an anti-bullying task force. And that's a comment from a community member that I heard last week. So she didn't even know until last week that there was a, a community task force. So, <clears throat> Seven things I want to talk about um, real quick. What is a task force? What is the purpose of this task force? 
What are our scope and limitations? When was this task force created? What has this task force been working on since it was created? What are we working on right now? And what are our strengths and challenges? So number one, what is a task force? So this is just any type of task force. Um, <clears throat> they're created to study and research a specific issue or thing to make unified recommendations, which may include impl implementation procedures, to submit those recommendations to those who have the power and resources to enact change. So what is the purpose of this task force? So what we know so far is that there's never been any documented research um, conducted in this community that specifically studied bullying or lateral violence. So that's um, something that we are taking on. Bullying exists on Six Nations at epidemic proportions. Um, the following is a list of questions that we are going to try to answer as part of the goal of this task force. So why does bullying exist on Six Nations? Who are the victims of bullying? Who are the perpetrators? Um, and we're speaking in general. Um, we're not looking you know, for specific people. We're just trying to kind of an generally answer those types of questions. How does it exist? And is able to thrive systemically? What measures have been put in place in both the present and past to address bullying in this community? Has it been effective, why or why not? What community programs and services currently exist that address bullying behavior and bullying victimization? Are those programs and services effective? What are their strengths? What are their challenges? And how can we improve those programs and services? So the ultimate goal of any task force, including this, is to create a list of recommendations on how to effectively address um, bullying. Number three, scope and limitations. So I'll start with the scope. Um, so what this task force is able to do. So we're able to research and study root causes of bullying. Um, we're going to be producing a final report, which includes all of the work that this task force is going to be doing, including all of the research, out of all of the data collected from the surveys, the focus groups, as well as that list of recommendations and implementation procedures. Um, we're going to we're currently engaging with community. Um, we want to reach all demographics, so we want to hear from parents, grandparents. Students, former students, teachers, staff, youth, children, um, knowledge holders, language speakers, elders, um, frontline workers, as well as the Two Spirit and LGBTQIA plus community. We want to hear as many stories as possible um, from community members on their experiences of bullying. We're conducting original research as well as well as data collection through surveys and focus groups that will tell us what types of bullying is taking place and at what level how it impacts community members mental health and well-being we're going to be analyzing policies all all community policies around bullying and lateral violence as well as analyzing community programs and services um, we're also working on community education events so all of this work needs to be done first uh, and then at which point we can take a solutions-based approach to a community wellness strategy. So limitations, <clears throat> every task force has limitations, it, things that are just not within the scope uh, of the work that they are able to do. So what are the limitations of this task force? So we want to hear directly from community members about their experiences, because if we don't hear directly from community members, then we, we just won't have a, a really good understanding of how bullying is manifesting throughout this community. Uh, we can document your stories. We do not record names. You will remain anonymous. Every task force member has signed an oath of confidentiality. We can provide you with contact information for various support services throughout the community. Um, but what we cannot do is investigate any incidences of lateral violence or bullying. So we can't go into the schools. Uh, we can't go into workplaces. We can't contact uh, anybody uh, allegedly involved in these incidences. We can't, um, you know, we can't contact uh, principals, vice principals, teachers, staff, students, or parents. Um, so that's the one of I would say one of the biggest mis, uh, misperceptions about what we do as a task force. Um, so I just wanted to to clarify that that is not within the scope. We just it's not that we don't want to. We just don't have the authority. Uh, to do that kind of work. 
<clears throat> so for when was this task force created? It was created in early um, November 2019. So it wasn't created by this council. It was created by the previous council. They, the original task force, I wasn't involved in uh, the work at that time, but they um, they had different leads at that time. And they were meeting regularly over um, between November and March 2020. The pandemic hit, everything came to a stop. Uh, all the work um, of this task force came to a stop. I was hired in, I started in January, 2022. So I've been in this role for about a year and a half now. What has this uh, task force been working on? Um, so when I started, we had to pretty much um, do a lot of the uh, ground up work. So recruitment was the biggest uh, thing that we started with. That took months. Um, then once we started to get more, we, we recruited more and more community members, we started to work on division, mandate, scope, and all of that went into the terms of reference. Um, then we had to wait for the terms of reference to get approved. Um, we established uh, subgroups within the task force, so we created a core team. The core team oversees the work of the entire task force. They um, kind of like go just guide the work. We created three working groups. Um, so we were uh, this we were advised from the beginning since this task force was created to um, create a working group on bullying in schools, try, try to help address the bullying going on within the schools, um, create a working group to try to help address lateral violence in the workplace. And that is all workplaces on, uh, on the reserve in this community. We also recently created a surveys and evaluation working group. So they are creating our community surveys. Um, we're going to have three different types, one for adults, one for youth, and we're going to have a staff survey as well. And we're going to be running some focus groups. So that's what that working group is working on and overseeing. We also have a subcommittee called the point of contact. So they act as that first point of contact between community members and the task force. Um, what, what else have we been working on? Just continuous discussions around bullying and what it looks like in this community. We have been able to identify eight main types of bullying um, that are most prominent in this community. Those eight types are cultural bullying, spiritual bullying, gendered bullying, sexual bullying, environmental bullying, political bullying, as well as online bullying and mob style bullying. We're, um, we were able to hire a researcher to do our literature review. So she's been on for about two and a half months now. And she's currently reading through all of the literature and there is a ton of literature on specifically um, lateral violence and bullying in Indigenous communities. Uh, we were working on the community education series for a while. Um, community ed engagements, which is the surveys, as well as we're currently also doing policies review. Number six, what is uh, the task force working on right now? <clears throat> so again, um, we're still working on that community education series. It was set to take place uh, monthly, once in May, once in June, once in July, and once in August. Those were meant to be in-person events. Um, we did the first two. The first one was a really great success. It took place during Community Awareness Week. Um, the June events, we didn't have that good of a turnout. And at that point, we had decided because it was costing money and the task force doesn't have any funding yet. And it was we we were had to look for funding to rent the hall, um, hire a caterer. And because we still don't have funding, we decided to cancel the rest of the in-person events and move them over to online. So that's something that I'm working on right now is um, <clears throat> I'm going to be doing a, a pre-recorded presentation and uh, just combining all of those four events into one. So I'm going to be talking about all of those eight types of bullying in a presentation pre-recorded and then it's going to get posted to um, social media as well as hopefully we can get it on council's website and maybe even get the link on council's app as well. Um, what else are we working on right now? So we're also actively doing the surveys. Um, we're attending events. Uh, we have the, the 
uh, the QR code that you can scan. You can also fill it out online if you go to the website. Um, I attended the powwow over the weekend and we got a good response there as well. And we're going to be looking at uh, attending some events throughout August to, to run those surveys. We do have a policies review working group um, that's now been established. We had our first meeting last week and we have policy analysts, three, three policy analysts on that working group as well as myself. And we have about 11 community um, policies around lateral violence and bullying that we're currently reviewing. We're also looking at defining those eight types of bullying. Um, we're going to be looking into running focus groups for programs and services in the community that deal directly with uh, like bullying and anti-bullying. Um, so finally, strengths and challenges. <clears throat> so I'll start with strengths. We have a great team of dedicated community members on the task force. Um, the more we delve into community-wide bullying and explore root causes, the more educated we all become on this issue, the more educated we are, the better equipped we are to come up with solutions. We have uh, a lot of community-wide representation on this task force. We have reps from both health and social services, supervisors, managers, um, Gonoko Shra, McMaster University, social workers, restorative justice and Indigenous victim services, um, human resources, lifelong learning task force, federal schools, Six Nations police, public health, health researchers, um, Two-Spirit and LGBTQIA+, community members, language speakers, and knowledge holders. We have a really, um, really great team. We're creating a really um, solid foundation for the work of this task force. We have a thorough understanding of what our limitations are as a task force. And we've identified those most prominent types of bullying that are taking place in this community, um, which is great as well. Our biggest challenge so far has been, uh, it's, the, it's the funding issue. This task force was not allocated funding, um, which is normal because um, you need to have a work plan. Um, and from that work plan, is, that's where your budget comes from. So that didn't, we didn't create that work plan until we, after we did the recruitment, um, we had to create that terms of reference and we had to have, you know, a lot of discussions around bullying and what this task force can and cannot do. So that work plan didn't come until um, like late last year, early this year. So since then, since early this year, we, we have been trying to secure funding and we have not been successful. Um, we were able to spend some fiscal dollars from one of the programs um, under health. So we were we were able to like purchase T-shirts with that funding. We were slowly finding funding, um, like for example, gift cards. Uh, I believe we've now we're, uh, secured funding. Those gift cards are incentives for our surveys. I um, believe that we also secured funding for uh, one other thing, but uh, we do have other costs that. You know, it would be really great to to really find funding somewhere so that it'll make our work a lot easier. So that that's been our biggest challenge with the with the work of this task force so far. And um, so just if you have filled out the survey, uh, just contact me. There's my information up there. And you just need to send me like a screenshot. If you did the online survey, send me a screenshot that says that it's been completed. And then I will arrange uh, a day and time with you to meet up to give you your t-shirt. So that's all I have. Excuse me. Okay, thank you, Nyama Jen, for walking us through, <clears throat> excuse me, your really important update. Um, what I'm going to suggest is, is do you have you has the team uh, put together uh, a, a, an operating budget? Yeah, we have an operating budget. Okay, so maybe what I would suggest then is if we can, Jen, if we can sit down uh, with yourself <clears throat> and as well uh, as uh, some of our members on our side so that we can maybe come up with a plan of action to bring forward to the next general finance meeting. 
uh, because I think it's important work. And I think that's something that we can be able to assist with, at least to start to get uh, on the goal of, because like, I see the work happening and it's, yes, unfortunately it's taken a little bit of time, but I think it's nonetheless, mm -hmm. it's it, the conversation has started. And I think that's the most important step is that we need to start to have this conversation. Um, and so <clears throat> what we can do, Jen, is maybe if I'll, I'll get Tammy to check in with you uh, to see on some availability of dates to get uh, before our next general finance to look at your budget. And then we can bring forward a recommendation to general finance to see uh, if we can get the support of the council to get that budget approved and to get you some funds flowing. The other mm -hmm. piece I think that I think that we can also touch on is in, in relation to in-kind contributions. So I know, I think uh, overall, I know there's so many things happening within community. You've got lives and sports and jobs and everything else within families. Um, and so we have also seen that uh, you get more engagement online. However, I know there are things that need to be in person. And so maybe we can look at other areas as well within your operating budget to look at in-kind, <coughs> excuse me, contributions, like say, for example, the waiving of the community hall of rental fees um, and things like that. So that's where we can work with you, Jen, to see <clears throat> on how we can solidify further your budget and what that looks like. Because I think at the end of the day, leadership has supported this. I know the previous, it was at the end of the mandate of the last council. Um, obviously, you know, there was there were some challenges there. And then obviously now with the pan, after that, the pandemic hitting. But I think it's still, it's, it's not like, it's not like we're saying that this work is not important. And so I think it's something that we need to further uh, just examine and to get you the funds that you need for your team to do this work and to carry this work out. Because I think, again, I do appreciate, I want to say now to yourself and all of your team, uh, for the work because this is a hard topic and this is something that affects all of us um, and I think that's it, it's it's a conversation and a time uh, that <clears throat> we need to have this uh, important uh, talk and as well as action <laughs> we need to all actionize what we're planning to do so do appreciate that work I'm going to open up the floor for any further questions or comments for Jen in her update on the anti-bullying task force Further questions or comments from council? Again, I, I'm, I may have taken a lot of the questions or comments. Okay, well, let's, let's start uh, with Helen uh, and then I, over I did to the you. survey and I, I liked the questions. I thought the questions were very good. I answered as many as I could. So I'm sure that's going to help a lot when more, if you can get more people doing the survey. It's covered pretty much of everything, so I thought it was really good. I, I, I agree. And yeah, I hope we can find the money because this is important. And I think this work is I, important. I totally agree. Thanks for that, Helen. And I also, while you were uh, talking, I was doing the survey as well. Listening okay. as well. It's nice to uh, it's nice to see that we're incorporating some different ways of serving. As you know, I'm like <clears throat> with the app and our technology and so forth. <clears throat> but I'm wondering as well. Is there a further opportunity, um, you know, to, you know, further assistance on our comm side to assist with that survey? Because Helen's right. I think as much as, as, as we could get as many people uh, to, to contribute on, uh, on their thoughts and input on the, the survey itself, I think I was really pleased to hear of your, you know, it's really nice to have that solution-based thinking and, you know, that we could actually back the data, back the data up uh, to what those solutions look like. So, do uh, appreciate that. I know uh, Caitlin's going to be reaching out to you as well, Jen, to uh, further any uh, communication efforts that you can collaborate on. I'll look okay. To, okay, thanks. Now after that, I'll look to Audrey uh, next. Hi, Jen, that was a good presentation. I enjoyed it. It's nice to see that you're doing so much. Uh, Michael's on representing us on lifelong learning. When I can make it, I'll, I'll make it. But you could um, just ask him to put that survey on the Lifelong Learning website. Maybe we could do the same for council as well and anybody else who has a, a site that could put it on and I think we could reach out to a lot more people that way. Good job and I'll move the recommendation to accept. Yeah, that's perfect and good, uh, good comments now for that Audrey. So there's a mover, there's a motion on the floor to move to accept uh, Jen's uh, update on the anti-bullying task force. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Greg. Any further questions or comments? Over to you, Melba. Yes, I do. Um, concerning the bullying, lateral, lateral violence, have you been concentrating on, on the addictions and the drug 
use in this community and how it affects families, grandparents, elders, uh, parents, right into the homes. Because as we know, um, uh, I guess they're not in their right mind. They're, they're in another place. And I think there's a lot of violence that is happening within the homes and we know in the community, which I will be speaking to a little later. But uh, have you been discussing that? Because that's a new epidemic that we are faced with in this community. So is there great discussions about that and as a root cause and how we can uh, further combat uh, uh, violence, lateral violence, uh, physical violence, all the violence that's attached to to those kind of things that are happening with our people? Um, so we haven't really been discussing specifically addictions um, or making that connection, but you do make a great point um, when you talk about when you make that connection to root causes. Um, that's something that our researcher is currently working on for the literature review is so now that we've identified those eight types of bullying, what she's doing is um, trying to identify root causes for each of those eight types. Um, and I imagine that when she produces her draft copy of the literature review, it's going to talk about addictions. Um, yeah. So that is a good point. I did make note of that. I will take that back to the core team for discussion. Um, but yeah, we are uh, we are waiting on that literature review to be done, which is going to tell us more, uh, explore those root causes a lot more. But um, like even those addictions have root causes themselves. Uh, so we need to try to trace trace those root causes back as far as we can. Um, you know, like the residential schools is one of the biggest root causes of, of all types of violence in our community. And uh, because of those types of violence, you know, a lot of people turn turn to addictions as coping mechanisms. And yes, they people uh, do engage in bullying behavior um, that also suffer from addictions as well. So all of that will come out um, in our literature review. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Nyama, for that, Jen. And just, uh, just to include some comments as well to the chat, um, Caitlin, with your uh, with your connection with Caitlin, our comms uh, person, will look to uh, partnership, maybe a partnership uh, with the Mental Health and Addictions Drug Strategy, which is Eve. And I'm, I think Caitlin has included that she will get used connected to see of the uh, further collaboration. On that part, so good, good comments, uh, Melba. Uh, over to you, Audrey. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to know if you've included elder bull bullying it and people with disabilities bullying. Yes, we have. Uh, we have identified elder bullying, and uh, that uh, will probably get added as like the ninth, as number nine. Um, no, I don't think we have discussed uh, like people with disabilities. That is a really great one that uh, we'll be adding as well and looking, exploring uh, those as well. And, you know, yeah, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. I think it's just, it's important to uh, you know to have these uh, conversations and discussions and these updates because it, it just further goes to other you know points that we could be inclusive of. So I'm, I'm appreciative of of all of the counselors' comments and and suggestions um, because again it's it's ultimately going to take a community to combat you know the progress the progressive uh, nature that we need to move forward in this community and living healthier better lifestyles. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, there's a few things then, Jen, so we'll uh, look to, uh, if I believe, just want to check in, it's been moved and seconded, is that correct? Someone can give me a thumbs up, yes. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded, I'll look to the vote at this point, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. In the meantime, Jen, I'll, I'll ask you to just touch base with Tammy, 
And then we'll look to uh, the budget uh, and looking to your, your operating expenses, any in-kind contributions that can be made. And we'll look to kind of solidifying that budget. And then we'll bring it back to general finance to council for final approval. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, well, Jen, keep up the great work. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you. Take care. Okay, Council, we're continuing moving along here. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the minutes of June 27th. So looking to the adoption of the General Council minutes of June 27th. Okay, it's moved by uh, Nathan. My apologies, sorry, I'm typing. Moved by Nathan, seconded by Michelle on the minutes. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, the next item is the reports. Uh, you'll see the meetings attended. We've had our uh, our elder uh, Norma, Norma General Lickers, who ha had attended with us on the June 12th and 13th Indian Day Schools motion hearing in Ottawa. And as well, she attended the Chiefs of Ontario June 1 Elders virtual conference. So you'll see those reports within your Dropbox. Not sure if there's any further questions or comments to those specifics, but if there is, please uh, reach out to uh, Norma for any specific questions or comments. And obviously do appreciate all of Norma's work uh, that she has done uh, for our council and our community, really, at large. So now I went to, to Norma for all of her work. Uh, the, I'm going to, oh, sorry, I see Nathan has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Just quickly, um, just wanted to give a little bit more information on the, um, one of the committees I, I asked to, to kind of sit on, the, the assertion committee. Assertion committee, sorry, assertion. The assertion committee at Chiefs of Ontario. So I've been attending the conference calls. Um, and essentially it's the Métis issue is what they're they're dealing with. So there's another call tomorrow. And what I'm gonna do is I'll, I'll provide a written update because the calls are really short and like a couple paragraphs for the update. So I just waited to, to get a few calls in. Um, so that'll be forthcoming. So I just wanted to give that update. Okay, that's perfect. Now on for that, uh, Nathan. <clears throat> we'll look forward to your update, uh, your report on that, on that front. Uh, Helen. I'm working on a report for the AFN too, and I'm only concentrating on a few of the issues that I know is going to impact Six Nations. Sure, no problem. Because I know there's also some some items from our team on the Chief's office as well that will be probably cross intersected on your report. So yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll bring that forward as well, uh, Helen, so right. do, do appreciate that. Uh, Michelle? Oh, oh, I see Michelle's, uh, so that's for the uh, Iroquois Caucus uh, working group, the hunting working group, is that correct, Michelle? Correct, so oh. I will submit that tomorrow. Okay, perfect, now for that, and as you know, we have upcoming, I believe, Hazel's attending along with myself um, and Jill and Trevor for the next Iroquois caucus happening uh, in the second week uh, of August in Ganawage. So there'll, there'll be some front, some more updates to come as those meetings uh, happen. So do appreciate all of the reports coming in. Uh, Greg? Oh, sorry, Greg, you're on mute. I just love saying that. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, yeah, following in line, uh, I do will uh, submit a report on the Jordan's principle. Perfect. Some of the things that, and I did have a chance to meet with uh, Jesse Garchor, who does our Jordan's principle here. So I can uh, actually uh, combine the two and uh, give us a more comprehensive update on Jordan's principle. That's perfect. And, I, and it's nice to see within the reports as well, like the, the, the takeaways, and like, you know, at the high level, but like to Helen's point of what is the specific impacts to Six Nations and now what is the further work that needs to be done politically. So it's nice to see that there, it's coming into fruition. So do appreciate all of, all of your work. Okay, Council, we're going to continue moving on. The next item we have is updates from our CEO. Um, there's a lot of things happening in the next uh, few weeks. So with that being said, Darren, uh, welcome to uh, your portion of the meeting. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Chief. We'll try and keep it uh, uh, not too quick, but there is a lot. Again, as, you, as everyone knows, there's lots going on, especially up and coming next month. 
uh, is we have our AGA scheduled for August the 24th uh, that was socialized at the last couple of council meetings in the open session. We'll be at the community hall, uh, hoping people will gather around four o'clock. Uh, we'll have food, we'll have presentations. We'll have our, our departments present to, to provide some engagement with community members if they have questions. And uh, we also have entertainment and food. So uh, one of the key things as well is uh, a drone show at the end of the evening. And that's meant to really signify the Walk the Track event, which has also been scheduled first. Now, I think we've solidified the dates of September 7th, 8th and 9th. Um, and uh, we have Tuesday, Johnston McDonald of TAP Resources who is available to walk through some of the updated planning and programming related more specifically to the walk the track. And she needs a couple of decisions tonight, uh, chief and, and council related to branding. Uh, we need to make, make some decisions around that for obviously for communications and uh, uh, the advertising and promotion for the event uh, and additional socialization of the event um, as well as the drone show storyline. Uh, so there's a lot there um, and I apologize, apologies for coming late. So that's why I asked uh, Tuesday to attend, to be able to kind of walk us through those pieces. Um, and uh, she's been very much involved in this uh, on a daily basis. We meet weekly, sometimes twice a week on these on these two items. So I'll turn it over to Tuesday and I believe she's ability, she has an ability to share her screen. Um, uh, Brooke or Tammy, I'm not sure. I think, I think you do Tuesday, do you have a share screen uh, ability there? I think you should be able to do that. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> there we go. I see something happening. All right. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I know it's late, so I'm going to try and be really succinct and focus in on the areas that we need some approvals on. Um, we did send you this document. Um, after the last meeting that we had, and we showed you some examples of branding, we heard you. Um, and this is what we believe uh, we heard. We've So we've gotten more of a focus on the Haldeman track, um, our shared history along the Grand River, again, trying to tie in with those, I'm gonna call them ally communities that live within the track, um, um, building that level of friendship with, with them that we, that we share this history. And then we have our little tag line six miles deep, um, we needed something snappy and easy to kind of uh, reference. You'll see that we have two distinct ways, depending on how we're using the um, logo. Um, that's how it will look. I'm just going to scroll down. And then we've just given you examples. We want to make sure that we have uh, Six Nations. Sorry. I just want to quickly, sorry to interrupt you. Is it possible to make your the one screen bigger? We're seeing two screens. Oh, yep. So the one you're referring to? That one better? Yes. Okay. You know Sorry about that. Cute babies, Tuesday. Pardon? Cute babies. You've seen the babies. Oh, the, oh my grandchildren. <laughs> Don't show us any more, though. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the Haldeman track, um, again, we want to make sure that we have Six Nations logo on here, uh, making that... And our idea is we want to, we're keeping the six in the forefront. Six miles deep, Six Nations Council, there'll be, we're recommending six educational stops as well, and we'll get to that. But just to kind of show you the different looks, depending on what we're doing and who we're targeting, the different looks of what that logo will look like. Any comments? Hopefully a motion saying yes, proceed. I guess I, I can begin. I, I, I like, sorry, if you can go back to the beginning one. I think it was your, it's, it's that, it was that, that um, image, but on the, the frontage. So yeah, that one, I believe. I think that one stands out a lot, a lot in, my, in my view. I mean, it's still nice to see, like, I like how you still incorporated the, 
you know, like the tract itself and what it looks like on a map. I really like to see that through the through the through the two-row rompum. I think that's quite creative. But those are my my thoughts so far. I'm not sure if there's any further thoughts or input on that, Helen. Yeah, I I, I wouldn't support the two-row wampum because I think most people aren't going to know what it is. I would support the one with the track. Just the same one we always see. The other that, that other one. That one. That one. Yeah, that one's nice. That is what it's all about, right? It's all about the track. That's what I would support. I, I get your point on that as well, in terms of uh, trying to make it as clear as possible as what what this initiative is about. Any further input? Over to you, Audrey. Yeah, I like the track picture right there as well because that's what we're going to look at and try and gain more allies in that area. Yeah, well, for that, uh, Greg, and, and yeah, that's the, that's really the whole goal, right? Is education awareness, uh, Greg? Uh, yes, because um, we have to realize that people don't have no idea. They have no idea along this, and it's heavily populated as you go from uh, north to south. And that if they can see visually what it's all about, and also there's some specifics with the map. I agree that um, that the the awareness here and, and knowledge is is very important to the to the communities. And now for that, uh, Greg, and I and now that I'm, now that just hearing from from them as well, I I do agree now to the point of 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 what they're making of you know really making having that that as the forefront. Of it, and I think it'd be it's it'd be nice. Obviously, to, it's easy to uh, to speak to as well in terms of you know the meaning behind logos and what and so forth. Are there any further questions or comments or input? Over to you, Kerry. Yeah, I just wonder if that six miles deep would would give them a uh, a different uh, like not six miles on either side. I'm just wondering if they're if the ones that don't know will say, you know, it's only six miles instead of twelve. That's part of the uh, campaign, Carrie. Um, we're trying to uh, not give them everything in the branding as much as trying to encourage them to say, "What's that?" What's six miles deep? Because that's part of the education that's going to be going on as well in the campaign, teaching them about that whole the whole track, teaching them about the wampum, the connections, and that kind of a thing. This is, um, but that's kind of our, our thinking. We wanted something a little bit snappy that would kind of grab people's attention and start asking questions. That was oh, our thinking, okay. anyways. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I can, I can understand that that thinking as well because we we don't want to. We still have some the series, the stops, right, to continue to educate, and that's where to Darren's point as well on the two row, um, on two row wampum piece that maybe be inclusive. I'm sure you have a piece on that too as well. Tuesday, we we do, and that's what I'm saying is that we can, for instance, we can use this version of the of the logo for the main logo. So when we do T-shirts and that, we can put this on on it. This would be our main one, but depending on what piece that we're talking about, we may we, we may go here. We may use this. So this is the consistent thing is the Haldeman track, our shared visions. And then this is whatever the side picture is, would be what we would use depending on what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I totally, I, I get what you're saying on those pieces. Sorry, I, I, I have Caitlin uh, who has her head raised. Hi, sorry if I'm not allowed to comment on this, but just with the map specifically, um, it may not be able to be seen in very small spaces if it's the logo itself and on a t-shirt, that's going to be really expensive to print because it's a lot of colors. So if you guys like that, it is more of a map detailed, I would go with the simplified version because then it's easier to see at a smaller scale. There's another version of this particular map as well that I'm going to show you because we've created another one like this that we're going to be using for to announce the campaign stops. So you might like that one 
as well. We just didn't put it in this version. If you give me two seconds, I can pull it up. Where is it? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. So this is the one where I also need um, acceptance, agreement, approval. Uh, this is the walk stops along the track. So Dundalk is where we're planning to have a ceremonial opening where we will launch the, um, the walk and the campaign a little quieter um, because it is at the tip of a highway. But that's where we wanna do a ceremonial kind of opening. And then the first education stop. So we're, we're um, planning on two stops per day and doing the campaign over a three day period. Um, again, that was a budget issue. So we came up with a creative approach. So the first stop would be in Fergus. And before I even go through that, we have consulted with Tanya and Taylor um, quite a bit on, on these stops as well. We wanted to make sure that we are in highly populated areas to be able to gain as much um, interest from people. So we have I get six stops, so we have seven, but the, seven, the Dundalk is the ceremonial start. Then we go to Fergus and the plan is that our walkers will um, come in two kilometers outside of the actual educational spot location um, to kind of garner that attention. We spend an hour to hour and a half at this educational stop. Um, we load people back up. We go two kilometers outside of the St. Jacobs is our next stop. We go two kilometers outside of that location, another hour and a half, and that's our first day. The next morning we get up, we go, we drop our walkers off two kilometers outside of the educational stop, hour and a half. They jump in the car again. We leapfrog to the next location, which is Brantford. And Brantford may end up being Paris because we understand that there is some, um, disruption potentially in Brantford. So we may need to, so we are prepared to, to, to jump to Paris very quickly if we have to, but right now we're identifying Brantford. And again, walkers would be dropped off two kilometers outside of the actual education spot, hour and a half back into the vehicle, um, into Cayuga, to, um, dropped off again, two kilometers outside the educational spot, and that is day two. And then day three is about Port Maitland. One, two, nope, yeah. one, two. Nope, day two is Cayuga, two kilometers. Out. So you see the same pattern, right? Two kilometers outside of the educational stop, hour and a half of educating, back into the vehicles, and then two hours outside of the, um, it's actually the pier in Port Maitland. Uh, two kilometers outside of that pier, walking into Port Maitland, and that'll be our final celebratory stop. Um, and we're marking it as a celebratory because we are looking for a sponsor to do the drone show a second time um, because we th we're actually looking to do it two more times for sponsors for that uh, because it's so important as far as creating that inspiration, that excitement, um, a lot of people are going to see those drone shows. They're not going to be able to hear the story because they're not in within range, but it's going to start causing a buzz. I know this because I've done these drone shows for other organizations under different, different campaigns, but we know what the response has been from the general population. They, they see those drones and they start asking questions. And one of the ways that we want to address that is the drone, st drone story we're gonna rewrite it as an article. And then after, um, we're gonna submit that for local community newspapers to, again, um, to garner attention or answer those questions after it's been shown. So those are kind of the stops that we're looking at, but this could also be, if you wanted a simplified map, um, this could be it as well, because it still shows people that um, where they live, right? <clears throat> I like that one. Yeah, I, I like it too. <laughs> of course, that's the one we didn't have in the. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, 
I'm just wondering, um, sorry, the dates again, because I know there's there's comment within our community on because we know we have we've been trying to revitalize our fall fair, um, which is I believe seven eight nine September. Is there? I just want to make sure that we you know we have enough enough to go around because <laughs> we know everything is so busy and we want to support as well as much as we can. Just don't know if obviously this would have so much of a uh, much of an impact or well, any. Do you want us to move the dates to early October? I mean, that's the dates that we've that we've identified so far, September eight and nine. Um, we do know that we are getting quite a bit of uh, attraction from unions and different organizations like that, universities who want to join in on the walk as well. Yeah, I guess it, I guess it's just unfortunate because I, I don't think we can move the dates at this point in time. I think it's it's uh, we have to keep going with what we have, but hopefully uh, we can get as many um, uh, people involved all while still supporting the fall fair as well. I'm just trying. I, I know there's always community events that are competing events at times of, with dates and so forth, but again, um, just trying to look at, uh, you know, supporting everybody. Uh, Darren, uh, well, we can we can certainly look at that uh, Tuesday. I think um, we haven't. I know we we we're looking at entertainment. We have to arrange for speakers, so a lot of that will be driven by availability of of that as well, um, and hopefully have mayors attend at those educational stops. So that still needs to be solidified a bit more based on that. And I don't I don't know Tuesday how much outreach. Has happened yet? Yeah, I mean, it's still you know trying to work on the dates, but yeah, certainly if the if we can shift them even a couple of days, uh, so that there's space for the fall fair, then maybe we have it after the fair. I don't know. It's just something something to throw out there um, that we can take away. So the fall fair is the ninth and tenth. Right. Yeah. We well, can. we so we could probably do it the six, seven, and eight. Just move it and not do it on the weekend. Or what about the following week, Tuesday, after the fair? What about 16, 17? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, we're already committed on those dates. Okay, well, that's that's why we're talking about it, right? Um, see what we can fit in. Okay. What, um, what, certainly, what? we could do the 11, the 11, 12, 13. What about even don't the following after that, Tuesday, the 23, 24? Yeah, we could do it the 23, 24, 25 kind of thing or 22, 23, 24, do it more over a weekend. Yeah, I think that could work as well, just in terms and maybe it also can give us a little bit more time to get letters out to mayors and so forth as well. Yep. Like on the, on the political side as well. Okay, so we'll say the 23, 24 and 25. Yes. Okay. I wasn't expecting that, but that's cool. <laughs> Gives uh, us more I time. <laughs> I, I just, and maybe this maybe this, this gives us more opportunity as well to like get more information at, at a booth at the fall fair to say hey this is coming up on the fall you know two more two weekends after this the fall fair right and it'll help us with the sponsorship um we have been doing pretty good on on sponsors we're seeing them step forward um not at the level that we need yet but certainly we're seeing we're seeing that and i'll i'll, I'll get to that so for the branding you're good with the way of the wording. I want to go back to that. If you can maybe go back to that on the screen and then I'm yeah. going to go and do just by virtue of hands raised. So I'll ask council to uh, look to your, uh, your, your hand emoji icon um, to look to then voting. So it's this, it's this really that we need. This is the kind of the branding here, right? And then we inter inter um, mix these pictures depending on what we're targeting. But the main one would that now be the one that that looks like this, but has the actual six seven stops on it. Are there any other input or comments to that? I just my only um, like when it goes back to the education piece, I think we could still utilize like you say. There's 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 shifting of uh you know the 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 targets 
uh, of it. And if we go to like, say a print, like to Caitlin's comment, like a print, then we can obviously shift to the easier one. That's going to be easier to print and, you know, less color and less all that. But I still like the mapping uh, from what the, the original, that one. Yeah. Like, I do I too. It's a clean, it's a clean look. It's, it's, it's simplified. It kind of addresses a lot. And then I think we could still utilize those other ones to the target mark to the target pieces. So uh, to be honest, I like with what I see on the screen right now. It's very clean cut. Uh, Greg. Oh, sorry, Tuesday, really quickly. I was just going to say we have had that conversation around it being small as well. Uh, the design team, um, but we think we can enhance it enough for a logo kind of perception, right? Um, so people can recognize their cities. And so then that starts to set in. Great, and I think that's the important piece is, uh, of the recognition of this whole initiative. Uh, Greg? Uh, yeah, I like this one too as well, uh, uh, Chief. But yeah, we can include others as well. The one with that, that that gives us the six stops and the seven at the beginning, um, there's a reason why we didn't include Caledonia, of course. We, we just didn't want any areas that would might be contentious. And also um, with Brantford, we had a little question mark about Brantford because, um, you know, some of the issues that have just recently popped up with, with Brantford. So we weren't quite sure about Brantford or Paris. And that's uh, that was just some feedback that we were looking at for as well, as if we should include uh, Brantford or um, include Paris. So that was another another topic that that we discussed. Hey, thank you, Nyama, for that, uh, Greg. Uh, so, Council, just by work by virtue, because again, to I want to just highlight Caitlin's comments in the chat as well as you know, the shape could be the main component, and you could use various versions based on what you're using it for. So, I think that's something that we can. Uh, that's very. Um, you know, uh, I think that's the route to take. But I would like to just go by a show of hands. So, councillors, uh, if you can, um, raise your hand. Oh, sorry, Tuesday, if you could just put the screen back up and I'll just scroll oh, down. Sorry. So, I just want to get a raise of hands of who uh, is is who is in favor of this. So, if you are in favor, please raise your emoji hand mm -hmm. of this image, which is on the screen. Okay, so it looks like majority is in favor of this one. So what we'll do uh, Tuesday uh, is go with this as the main, uh, and then whatever we have to shift in terms of the target of, of the shape and so forth, we'll utilize the, those others. Okay. okay, back over to you. Tuesday. So the next, the next area that we need um, decisions on, and I was really hoping not to have to read the actual story. So <laughs> we did send it to you in advance, um, the drone story. Um, we've had a lot of time with it. We've revised it a couple of times. We shared it with um, Taylor and Tanya. Greg has seen it. Um, we have the images you have it. We sent, we sent it to you yesterday and I apologize that it wasn't a lot of time for you to read it. Um, it does identify what the images would be. Um, so I guess my first question is, do you want me to read it? or do you want, or have you read it and ready to question it or, and hopefully approve it so that um, it has gone, I'm sorry, it has gone to the drone people because they had to start making images. If we have to change things, we have to change things, but they, um, we are on tight timelines. And for that Tuesday, I'm gonna to look to open the floor for further questions, comments, Audrey. I'd rather you read it. I don't have a copy of that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Audrey. Um, so Tuesday, roughly, if you can do it quickly, I know obviously <laughs> Greg's seen it. I know I don't want to take up too much time, but I think if you can just really the high level, and I think it it should also kind of be a little bit of a surprise too, <laughs> uh, right? So we don't want to share everything, right, to the point. Exactly. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I'll read the first. Uh, first paragraph, we'll start with that. Let me put your mind at ease. These are the words that bind all Indigenous agreements with any other government. Our treaties were based on that philosophy. Our minds will be at ease when we hear the words of our ancestors whispered in our ear. 
This is what is intertwined in our wampum belt and our agreements with the Crown and with Canada. It is the basis for our peace and friendship as nation to nation allies, the Haudenosaunee meaning people who are building the longhouse, commonly known as Iroquois. Our Iroquois speaking Confederacy of Native Americans and First Nations people in North East North America and upstate New York, the English call them the Five Nations, comprising the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca from east to west. After 1722, the Iroquois speaking Tuscarora from the southeast were accepted into the Confederacy, which became known as the Six Nations. So right away, we're teaching them about who we are and the agreements that we have. Um, I'm going to uh, jump to the third, fourth paragraph. When the first Europeans arrived in North America, they had no idea how to survive on this land. They needed the indigenous people to show them where to gather medicine, find food, even how to stay healthy in winter. Basically, not only survive, but how to thrive. The co colonialists wanted furs to take back, so they were totally dependent upon the indigenous nations to supply these furs. Business was good. However, the Europeans brought their old animosities and wars to this land. The English defeated the Dutch and made new treaties. They asked us to be their allies and protect their economic interests, which we did. And every time we agreed to help, we put their minds at ease because we considered them to be our brothers. Through our Silver Covenant Chain Treaty, we pledged to be allies to, um, forever. And you'll notice that we're theming ease of mind because one of the objectives is to ease the minds of people along the track that we are not going after land back, but holding federal government um, accountable. So that's the reason, the very specific reasons for that. I'm gonna jump down a little long more. So Joseph Brand, a Mohawk military and political leader, while not born into the hereditary leadership role within the Iroquois League, Brant rose to prominence during his education, abilities, and connections to British officials, rallied some Mohawk, Seneca, Cugan, and Onondaga warriors to, to rise to defend the interests of their old ally, the Crown. Some Oneidas and Tuscarora warriors decided to assist their American neighbors in their fight for freedom, being on opposite side, shook the foundation of the great law of peace, peace which was extended, intended to halt war amongst the people. The price for aid, aiding was harsh. American rebels confiscated most other Mohawk homesteads in the Mohawk Valley. The American soldiers destroyed over 50 villages with the intent of alienating the Haudenosaunee. It won't be my voice that's saying the story, by the way. <laughs> I'm gonna skip down a little bit further. At the end of the War of 1812, Superintendent of Indian Affairs, William Claus spoke to the warriors post-battle and used a healing ceremony that the Mohawks knew and practiced. With these words, he honored the warriors. Your eyes are so full of tears that you cannot see. Clearly your ears and throat are stopped up. Your hearts have been in trouble with grief. Your limbs are still covered with mud. Your feet are full of thorns and your seats are still covered with blood. He then took a cloth and wiped the tears. He took a feather and wiped the dirt from the warrior's ear so they could hear the words. He then wiped away the mud from the legs of the warriors to unburden them. This was the first part of the ceremony. The other half was to recover the bones of the fallen and then to compensate the nations for their losses. After the War of 1812, when the Haudenosaunee at the Grand River aided their allies once more, the land matter grew worse. White squatters moved onto the Haldeman track and the federal government first tried to remove them, but in the end sided with the squatters so that they could keep the lands they stole. Then the Crown finessed a number of alleged surrenders from Six Nations, which further reduced the Grand River territory to present day reserve boundaries, which rapidly divided the land into smaller plots. Uh, where'd I go? Plots and sold those plots to Canadians. In the end, the people at Six Nations only held about 48,000 acres, a small percentage of the 1784 pledge. Okay, that goes through the history. I'm going to skip down a little bit more. Just really quickly, to say, I think I think we're getting we're getting we're getting a, a, a you know a, a good um, you know a good kind of I guess um, version of what of what we're trying to accomplish here. So maybe we could we could pause at this point. I think if the, it's been vetted through our staff, uh, you know, who are our key staff to help on the on the on the getting the correct uh, factual information of of this piece. I, I think. We are prepared uh, or can look to a decision to uh, accept uh, the story because I know obviously time uh, is of essence. 
uh, on this part. So I will look to open the floor up for any further questions or comments on this decision point. Audrey. Yeah, did Phil and Lonnie, are those the staff that, that helped with this? Uh -huh. Yes, the, to my understanding, their office has been involved in, in this, correct, Tuesday? That is correct. Taylor and Tanya. Taylor might want to speak to it specifically. Okay, there's Taylor. She has her hand raised. I'll go over to Taylor really quickly. And if I can ask uh, Tuesday, if I could just get you to, uh, to stop your share screen. And then Taylor, you have the floor. Good evening. Yeah, um, Phil, Lonnie, and also one of our historians for the litigation went over it and they made some uh, edits and comments and, uh, of additions that uh, Susie and her team have incorporated into it. Okay, thank you. Now for that update, Taylor, are there any further questions or comments on this portion? Uh, that being said, Tuesday, just to clarify, you do need uh, official, I guess, support or decision on accepting this storyline. Is that correct? Well, yes, we want to make sure that you're comfortable with it. It doesn't have to be a necessarily a motion. It could just say in the minute. I think, yeah, I think we're I think we're good to proceed. If there's no opposition from council, I'm not seeing any at this point. So that I think um, Tuesday is sufficient enough to proceed. Okay, great. So then the next piece, as you know, uh, we are now focused on uh, the actual educational stops and we need some input and some direction. So um, at each stop will be pretty much the same uh, program. We have uh, Gary Farmer and Derek Miller will be joining us to, um, as a way of, again, pulling people in. They'll start with a bit of a concert. Um, we have Eddie Thomas will be joining us. They'll be incorporated again, um, sharing some of our traditional social dances. We'll have indigenous food tastings, not a meal, just tastings there. Um, but the speakers that we need some, let me make this bigger. Come on. And you have this as well. So basically, let me start. We just talk what the project is, um, what the objectives of the campaign is. We wanna make sure that we're in line and that how we've interpreted is the same as you are, as, as yours. We actually just pulled it off the RFP. Um, our target audience, our community members, the AGA, and then the population living within the boundaries. So that's the education stop. Single most important message, um, the Haldeman track is legitimately significant to Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee people, and the Crown's failure to honor their fiduciary responsibilities. That is the, single most important message that we are trying to get across. And we're saying it in a lot of different ways. Um, what do we want our target population to think or do having participated in the campaign? We want them to be more aware of the track history and the current status in regards to Six Nations and that they have a shared history with us and to realize the significant impact mm -hmm. and legitimacy of the launch litigation. We wanna hear them say and react with, I didn't realize that. I didn't know that, how can I help? And the answer to that will be to write their local MPs and NPPs in support of the Crown resolving the litigation with fair financial compensation. Um, and then the overview, this talks about the AGA and basically we have um, Jace Martin and Keith Sicola doing two 30 minute shows, one at the beginning, again, as a way to draw community members in, let's get them in there and then we, sh we shift <laughs> to more of the ADA and council update. Um, and then uh, Keith and Jace will come back near the end of the night. Eddie Thomas is also uh, coming in and we'll do some social dancing um, as part of that. The drone show will end the evening because that has to be shown as, um, at dusk and it will formally kick off the, the campaign. There'll be food stations and I had recommended that as, as um, again, to encourage that circulation and movement with all of the uh, program booths that we create uh, food stations. And so we've talked in, with Clint Atkins and he's going to be the caterer. Uh, food station one, I don't know if you want this kind of detail, but food station one, corn soup, ham and scones, 
food station two, mm. Indian tacos, food station three, assorted sandwiches and salads, station four will be the drink station. So again, so that there's movement. Um, the big question, though, is of what we have and we're working on is the campaign agenda, those those six educational stops. We do envisioning uh, Chief Hill and or his designate speaking, um, if not at all of them, certainly at key ones, certainly at the beginning and at the end, Chief. Um, six Nations traditional council representatives. I've yet to reach out to them to talk to them about it, but it would be good if we could get somebody like a Frank Miller, a Brian Miracle, a Jock Hill, somebody that would come and speak and, and we will be really clear. The intent of the campaign is to promote the awareness around the Haldeman deed and the Haldeman track, not the political issues that we're experiencing here in the community, but we need to build those allies along that track and increase their level of awareness. Um, we've uh, targeted um, some scholars to also speak, uh, Don Martin Hill, Susan Hill, Teresa McCarthy, Rick Mentor, and Andrea Jacobs. Andrew, yeah, Andrea Jacobs, who is a Mennonite minister and a Six Nations member who is also very involved in the community and very supportive. Uh, again, uh, the idea is to have them speak on areas that they have already written on in support of the Haldeman track, in support of our community, the issues that you can see we've targeted Don Martin Hill on, on her um, work on water quality. Um, Rick Mentor to discuss the history of the track and then just so we're, those are the names that have come up in our research because um, we thought it was important to not only have our political representatives speak, but also some of our scholars. And then um, where we're kind of really, really need your help is around allies, because we think it's really important to also have our allies. Now, some of these people will be recorded and used in some of the media campaigns, but, um, and some of them will actually be on site to speak who's ever available. We have not reached out to anybody because we wanted your approval first on the targets. Um, one of the allies that we think is extremely important to record is um, the Mississauga mayor. They've just gone through a major um, land claim and it has worked out very well for Mississauga. They've developed a relationship with the new credits or with the credits uh, community. Um, so it's important to highlight that this is not necessarily, this is not a bad thing. Great work can come out of it. Great relationships can come out of it. So that's kind of the, the focus and the reason that why we're highlighting the mayor. But other allies, we weren't sure if you had any other specific people that you would like us to incorporate. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for that uh, Tuesday. So I'm gonna pause here and look to further questions uh, or input uh, for uh, Tuesday on this. Uh, first, beginning with Audrey. Yes, I took it off mute. Uh, Tuesday, um, are you explaining the word Haudenosaunee as you go along through this? That's one question. And the second one is the list of people you have as scholars there, the majority of them are doctors. They have their PhDs. I'm not sure about Andrea Jacobs, but I think the rest do. And people, uh, what type of people are you looking for? You're not wanting to turn this into political, are you? No, 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 we're, we're, it's very educational. The only reason we have the Mississauga mayor in there is because they have experience and ha have had good outcomes and build a better relation with not only the Mississaugas, but with Indigenous overall. It's not about being political, it's about sharing success. Okay, thank you. I think just really quickly as well uh, to say maybe another in terms of that success part is um, maybe a representative say from like Waterloo University who's just uh, you know obviously acknowledged and and seen as our our members in new in new credit or credit first nation have uh, free tuition uh, you know they're really making I guess a, a stride in reconciliation by allowing you know really real action so I know there's other universities that are in queue of, of following steps so maybe that might be one. Oh, that's a great idea. Okay, we'll follow up there. Okay, thanks for that. And then obviously we can help with any other, if there's any political, you know, people needed as well. Like I know obviously this isn't the goal to make it political, but it's safe for the stops. 
if you uh, would like to have under like from the chief's office to maybe reach out, uh, please we'll uh, we'll connect offline and go from there. Okay. The okay. Is there anything further on your part? I do. I just want to see uh, decision points. I know there's a recommendation on the agenda again that's laid out. We've already done the branding option uh, as well as the drone show narrative, and I think this is now uh, the piece of 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 people being included as well as the educational stop. So we went through those pieces. So I'm going to pass it back over to you Tuesday and then I'll look to just have a motion that encompass all of that so that we have clear direction moving forward. Okay. So just passing uh, it back to you for any final pieces and then I'll look to uh, the recommendation. Okay, so here is kind of the final piece I've already identified. Gary and Derek are joining us. Um, Eddie Thomas is joining us. We're also incorporating some theatrical skits and the theatrical skits is to help relay the message that um, why the Crown granted us uh, the track in the first place, our contribution to making Canada, Canada. So those skits will will be part of that. This is we're actually pulling them. We did this for the AFN and the Chiefs of Ontario back in 2017. We it was a it was a year long of consultations with the First Nations across Ontario around what those highlights that we were supposed to do and writing of this theatrical performance um, that we that we played. So we're pulling um, a couple of those significant. Um, pieces that's going to help emphasize our contributions of that of that piece. So that's the that's the last piece as far as what's going to happen in those educational sessions. You know, uh, it's Melba. Hi, hi, Melba. Yes. Uh, what kind of role is Phil and Lonnie and Taylor going to play? Because they've uh, certainly been a good lead for us over the over the years and of course Taylor she's great even though she's quite new but she's really great so I think there should be a role in there when we come to education they're they're the ultimate of what we have here so Taylor and Lonnie um, and Tanya have been involved with this project all the way through we rely on them deeply um, and we pass through, Taylor sits in on all of our meetings. Caitlin is starting to join us now as well. So we have some really strong involvement. We would be happy to <laughs> incorporate, I mean, one of our thoughts is to record um, Phil. It could be Lonnie, but to record Phil would be one of the people that we would record and use in some of the social media as well. But happy to, Taylor, you wanna talk at the educational subjects? <laughs> happy to incorporate you. I think, I think um, oh, sorry, Taylor, sorry, sorry, Chief. I was just gonna say, I know probably like I know like one, one of the questions coming up about this, if people are gonna ask for litigation, and, and, and it might be a good thing to have Lonnie at one of the stops, perhaps, because you know he can give a, a pretty good history of because he's been with the litigation for so long. And I, like in it's all it's it's gonna be one of the obvious questions that come up once you're at the educational stop. So he might be someone to, to consider having at one of them. Or even just or recording like Tuesday mentioned. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great and thanks uh, thanks Melba. I do agree. I think you know we need to incorporate as as much as we can in terms of that you know having that knowledge that each of them carry. Uh, Audrey. Yeah, I'm just checking Tuesday if you expect or, or suspect that there might be any kind of political interference from other um, factions on the reserve. And if so, do we have security people for that day? Great question, Audrey. Um, we've had some discussions on that, but we are working really hard to make sure that this campaign is being presented and delivered from a point of celebration, friendship, and uh, allyship. And our focus is on educating on the Haldeman deed. Whether we have uh, fractions that, you know, like I'm just going to say it, the ATC and 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 council and and the interventions that they tried to make in the in the litigation, we are by promoting an education, educating on the Haldeman deed, it supports both fractions. It doesn't hurt either either side. Um, 
and I do have to have a conversation with them yet, and that's why I'm, uh, that's why it's TBC beside that traditional council representatives around that. Um, it's also part and parcel of why I've, I've kind of highlighted Frank Miller and Brian Merkel. They're uh, from the Mohawk side and not involved in the HCC aspect. So getting them to come in and talk around the Haldeman tax track specifically. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't think so, but it's, I mean, or, and we don't hope so, but I we can incorporate. I think that's the beauty of doing all this open. I mean, this, this meeting is live on Facebook, this is live for our community to watch. Uh, and I think that's maybe where, you know, we can also, um, you know, it's not like we're, we're trying to do this without anybody knowing, <laughs> you know, we want to incorporate as much as, as we can, in, in, including them. So if they choose to be a part, by all means, I think that's the beauty of this uh, this initiative, as you have mentioned Tuesday and laid out that, you know, we're looking to, again, educate, create that awareness up and down the track. Yeah, we're not we're not getting into the litigation in the sense of who's who's the lead of that. We're getting into um, educating people on the Haldeman track, which is a benefit to our community. Great. Just that basic knowledge. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tuesday. Uh, are, is there anything further Tuesday on your end that you need to update council on? Because I will at this point, again, I will, uh, there is a recommendation on that encompasses everything that we've just discussed. And I'll look to a mover and seconder. If there's nothing further on your end Tuesday. No, that's, um, if you want to know where we're at as far as sponsorship, but other than that, you've gotten the key highlights of where we need, um, you know, an, a nod to proceed. Okay. Perfect. So what I will do then at this point in time is you'll, I'll, I'll shift council to the recommendation on our agendas, which is recommendation 7-1. Again, I'm just going to refer, therefore, it be resolved that Six Nations of Grand River approve the following options for the Walk the Track campaign. One, which we just walked, what we just walked through, the branding option, which uh, Tuesday uh, put on her screen for us. The drone show narrative as written, again, that's been uh, vetted through all of our uh, uh, key people on, on council side. The education stops to include, so we dis discussed those pieces as well. So I, I will at this point in time look to a mover and seconder on recommendation 7 1. I'll Moved move Melba. Great. Seconded by Melba. Are there any further questions or comments? Again, this does give that direction and and approval for Tuesday to continue on with the mandate and the work uh, of this initiative. It's been moved and seconded, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Greg, seconder? Melba. Seconded by Melba to waive second reading on the previous motion, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Well, thank you, Nyawa, so much, Tuesday, for joining us this evening and providing us with the update of such important work. Uh, we'll look to touch base uh, at the Chief's office on some of the other pieces that we discussed here tonight. In the meantime, I think you have the direction and, and, and so forth to continue on with the mandate. Okay, thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great evening, Tuesday. Nyawa, so much. I'm going to pass the floor back over to yourself, Darren, on 7 2. Election code update. So mute myself. Here we go. Um, yeah, so, so if you recall, council, we had a point appointed. I don't know. I don't know Lori is still still there. <laughs> I'd asked her to come quite a bit earlier. I don't know if she's still in the council chambers, but um, we had appointed Lori Harris as our CPO uh, a couple of weeks a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have since met with the election code committee to look at the next steps related to uh, having a vote on the code. A poll, a polling on the on the on the recommended changes to the code. If there will be any changes, they will be um, accounted for through through that. And this so this recommendation speaks specifically that to that so that we can request the voters list from from membership or actually through 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 ISC via membership. Um, we have to have it specific to to the dates uh, because it's obviously a point in time in terms of that list and who's on who's included on the list as an eligible voter and who isn't. Uh, so this is this recommendation just kind of lays that out in terms of the steps that were uh, talked about at the at the last meeting. So essentially, what they there was a lot a strong feeling that we should we we should try to accommodate elders who are not able to 
uh, come out to say, say we're looking at having it at the agenda at the AGA on August the 24th, uh, having a booth set up for the vote for the general public between four and 9 p.m. But if elders are unable to make that, we want to have an opportunity uh, for them to do advanced polls. Schedule that was also in, in the Dropbox in terms of locations. Uh, so those those would be on um, noted there August 2nd and 9 at different time periods from 10 to 12 and to 2 to 4 p.m. on both of those days, just to have that opportunity. Um, uh, we have also identified those locations for those advanced polls as Sunrise Court Common Room, uh, the Pine Crescent Common Room, Jay Silver Hills and Iroquois Lodge. So four different locations to make it as easy as possible to have our, our seniors, our elders be able to, to have a say in, in that code uh, uh, vote, and I see I see Lori there. So I think I've, I kind of I kind of probably covered it all, Lori. But uh, I think it's it's just a step that we have to take uh, in order to get that voters list and be prepared to be able to facilitate those advanced polls and then then the final vote. It has to be done before the uh, before the first of September. I think September fifth is the actual date that the new code needs to be enforced in effect, uh, which is a number of weeks before the general election can and advanced polls for that. So. Uh, I think that's it. Lori, did you have anything more to add? I think I covered it pretty well. Well, yeah, I'd like to say thank you very much for <laughs> appointing me as the chief electoral polling officer. I'm not used to being on the screen. I'm used to being on the radio. <laughs> but I, I feel that my past experience with elections is warranted in this position. So I thank you for having the confidence in me. I did do the advertising in the two row times. I missed the Turtle Island by a couple of hours so that it'll be in this week's paper. But in the two row times, it will be for the 19th and the 23rd, is that right? 23rd, what's today? <laughs> but anyways, it's gonna be for four weeks anyways, up until the advanced poll, which is August 2nd. Like Darren had said, we do have two elder polling advanced polls. And then the community final poll will be on August the 24th from four until 8 p.m at the Six Nations Community Hall, along with the AGA. Okay, so thank you Jan, so much. And also want to extend uh, my congratulations to you, uh, Lori, on your on your appointment as our new uh, Chief Electoral Polling Officer. Uh, do appreciate, again, it's, uh, it's, it's not the, uh, what's the word? There's not a lineup for that position, so it's <laughs> nice to see that there's interest, at least from a uh, from uh, you know few of our members to to take on this role. It's not it's not an easy role, but again, it's a it's an appreciate it's a role that's very appreciative, uh, as again uh, does uh, lay out our our governance uh, through mm -hmm. the system. And so, do appreciate your your time, <clears throat> and also looking to at this point in time, there is a recommendation um, seven two, which is on uh, your agendas. Uh, there's the again the therefore be it resolved uh, to accept the recommendation to have our chief electoral polling officer oversee a vote on the recommended amendments uh, to the Six Nations of the Grand River 2019 election code and be it further resolved that the vote to be inclusive of advanced polls for elders from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. as well as 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. on both August 2nd and 9th and with the final community vote in conjunction with the annual general assembly on August 24th with polling hours beginning at 4 p.m. So that reads uh, the uh, recommendation. If there's anything further, uh, questions, comments, um, I see Darren has his hand raised. Just quickly, uh, we had actually amended that recommendation. It's just, it should read between four and 8 p.m. It's just a minor change, Chief. Oh yeah, sorry, I, uh, I, I see that change. Okay. Thank you, Noah, for that. Kerry? Yeah, just one question on uh, the options that they had were, if, if they wanted to stick with uh, nine counselors or 12. So would, so if they if 12 was chosen, 
would they have districts or would it just still be one one district yet? They had actually taken that question out. They did have change to districts, change back to districts. I don't know what happened to it. And I can speak to that. There was a long discussion about this. <laughs> yeah, I think that the issue the issue is if if it goes back to twelve. It has to be that could be implemented in the next the, the next term election the 60th. That's if right. it goes back to if it goes back to districts, then we have to vote by district, which complicates it. So we've only had um, at large for one term, which is the this term for this term of council. So it was felt that if it goes back to 12, that's fine, but there wouldn't be districts for this current election. But it, if they wanted to look at implementing that for the following election, they could. It's just that it has to be like it has to be done that way by districts, which is complicates the whole the whole scenario. And we've only gone by sort of at large one time. So that was their thinking. Okay. Is, is there any further questions or comments? Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing. Uh, can any I can I ask another question? Sure. Yeah, what about um the time frame of, of counselors uh, uh, working in the community. Is it going to be, we always say, you know, oh, we're part-time workers. Is it going to continue as part-time or is it going to be full-time? That's going to be meaningful to people who, who um, want to put their names forward because many people are, are full-time employees various places. Looking to uh, Darren or Lori on that. I don't think that one was included. Mm -mm. No. No, it wasn't. Um, they had done some uh, survey, pre preliminary surveys to find out what issues or things people wanted to have a say on. Um, and it, it, they look at the prevalence of those requests. And that wasn't, I don't know that that was a prevalent request. I, and I think that's something that would have been socialized from council back to the committee. So um, I, I don't think that it's it's off the table. Like we can take it back to them and see if that was a consideration. Um, I think it is a consideration from a budgetary perspective of the new council, if they decide to do that. But I take your point, Melba, that if you're running for council, you'd like, it'd be good to know that. So certainly Lori and I can take that back and, and see if they had consideration of that, what their consideration was, and if there's room to add that question or include some reference to that, that this would be part-time or full-time. Uh, one more thing, uh, the community trust, I believe, always had their election also coinciding with elected council. And people are going to want to know if they have a choice, because that's what happened in the past. If they put their name forward to be elected councillor and was not uh, successful and put their name into the community trust, uh, they could uh, revert over to the community trust if they weren't successful in the Six Nations Council election. That was, was my that understanding. That? Yep. So that, that's going to continue. Thank you, Lori. You're... Pardon? That, that's going to continue in, in Melba for the trust. It's going to? Yeah, that was my understanding. Is that correct, Lori? That's what I understood too. But that'll be at the general election. That won't be at the elector election code vote. On the amendments, right. Yes. Yeah, no, I was referring to the actual election. Yeah. Well, I'm but going to be approaching council. Yeah, I'm going to be approaching council for the date. Once the election code has been decided for the elect uh, the general election. Okay. Okay, yep. and that'll be ironed out then. The community yes. will know. Yes. That's okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Now for that, uh, Melba. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? 
So just really quickly then, just a question out of curiosity. So will, uh, at that point, Lori, when you bring back further the approval for the dates of the general election, so that will include when, like what, what date this council works up until? Because I know yes. that, was, that was one of my issues. I mean, we were elected on Saturday, you were sworn in Tuesday. It was no, there was no transition, there was no nothing. And our job and goal is to set up the next council for success. So I'm hopeful that it's not like that. Well, well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we have at least two weeks before the next council comes in for a transition. Okay. All but right. We have to work that out with council. I want to work that out with you all beforehand. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. And I'll have a possible dates draft for you. Okay. All right. So we'll look to have that at our next, uh, our next update. Are there any further questions or comments on the recommendation on your agendas? Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing none. I'll at this point call for a mover and seconder on recommendation 7-2. Moved by Nathan, second, second. seconded by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Nathan, seconder. Seconded by Michelle. She's looking to fly. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> Seeing our hearing done, motion is carried. Okay, now I thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Lori, uh, for coming and joining us this evening. And again, congratulations on your appointment. Now, yeah, well, have a great evening. See you soon. Yeah. Okay, council, we're going to continue moving along our agenda. I know it's a, oh, sorry, Helen. Yeah, can I have a few minutes to deal with uh, Sherry Lynn's email? Yeah, I'm just going to just really quickly, if I can, I want to finish up scheduling, Helen, and then I'll pass the floor back to yourself. Right. Okay, uh, council, really quickly, if you could go back to your agendas under scheduling, recommendation 8-1, I do need a delegate to attend if anybody's available and interested to attend the official launch of the Grand Parade fundraiser, which is taking place on August 2nd at the Charlotte Villa, which is located at Brantford. Is there any interest or availability from any counselor to attend this? Uh, what time? Uh, Tammy, can you confirm the time? Just give me a second. Oh, sorry, just one second, Michelle. While she's doing that, on council, I'll, I will come back on the time for 8-1. I'm going to shift to 8-2, which is also, I need another counselor or counselors who are interested and available. Uh, this is happening again in Brantford at the County of Brant, 2023, Ontario, 55 plus summer games. It's the opening ceremonies happening uh, at uh, on Wednesday, August the 9th, starting at 5.30 p.m. It's going to be located at the Wayne Grexby Sports Center. So this is the opening ceremonies of the Ontario, the Brent, the Ontario 55 plus summer games. And to answer your question, Michelle, 2 p.m. for the first one. Uh, Nathan. I can cover the second one, that was the night. Okay, perfect. So can I look to a mover to uh, insert uh, Councillor Nathan's name into the recommendation A2, moved by Helen, seconder. I'll second Melba. Seconded by Melba. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Okay, back to the first one. Again, this is the Grand Parade fundraiser, August 2nd in Brantford, starting at 2 p.m. Is there any interest or anyone available? And if not, well, we can ascend our regrets. We just want to make sure that if anyone is available, I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, what, so I'm- Which one is that for? This is for the Grand Parade fundraiser. What is the Grand Parade? It's, a, it's the Charlotte Villa. Is there background, Brooke and Tammy on this? That's a good question, Tam I mean, Helen. I don't know, like, what is it? 
sorry, I'm just going to look to Brooke and Tammy really quickly on this one. Well, we know it's a fundraiser, but. Yeah. I can why do that. Do have... okay. Why do we have to be there? It's, I think. It's, not, it's not necessarily that we have to be there. It was just we were, we were invited if we, if we wanted to. So if we. Oh, if... I don't. Yeah, I question why we'd even be invited, but. Okay, I mean, it's always nice to receive invites. <laughs> but uh, I will, uh, I see Michelle is available. So we'll, if oh. I can get a motion to have Michelle attend this event, Michelle will get you all the background and details to the event itself. Uh, is there a mover and seconder to that? Moved by Helen, seconder. Second by Greg, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Um, and just again, under scheduling as well. So we were going back and forth uh, on the uh, NAG, our NAG athletes. I know we have a lot of champions in this community. We know we want to be equal and fair and recognize and acknowledge all. So we had decided to uh, hold off on the NAG and because I know we have a lot of tournaments happening right now as we speak. And say, for example, the Rebels are uh, also uh, in, in, in progress. So hopefully we may have more. So what we want to do is acknowledge all of them at the end of August. Uh, we're going to have a community event for all of our athletes for the whole year, inclusive of NAG in the U, U, U16, U19, the Rebels, everybody. Um, and so that's part of our planning. But our other uh, event that we have is August 3rd planned at five till seven at the community hall. You're going to start to see some communication go out. This will be uh, acknowledging and recognizing Brandon McClure. Uh, in his work uh, through the Stanley Cup. So that will happen again uh, Thursday, August 3rd at the Community Hall from 5 till 7. Um, he'll be there again um, engaging with uh, our community, taking pictures, signing autographs, stuff like that. And also we'll be doing a check presentation uh, from the sales of the fundraiser that we created for the lawn signs of his jersey, um, which I know, I don't believe we have a tally as of yet, but there's going to be about five organizations to receive um, uh, roughly $2,000 or $2,500 each, whatever that number is and comes up with. And so Brandon will be there to present uh, the check uh, to each of those organizations as well that evening. So just a FYI, August 3rd is a community event happening. Um, that being said, I also would like to wait second reading on the two previous motions just really quickly before I go to Michelle. Is there a mover and seconder to wait second reading? Moved by Helen, seconder. Second by Greg. Oh, thanks, Malba. We got Greg seconded by Greg to waive second reading. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Back over to you, Michelle. So that's nice. We're going to recognize all our athletes. Um, I just had some parents come forward um, who did not get sponsorship through council. So apparently when we got the list from Meg, it was of all the players who hadn't paid. So we probably have a dozen of players that paid and are looking to see if they're going to get the $300 support as well. So, um, and then there's also players that didn't go that we did sponsor. So there is some reconciling that needs to happen, but I wanted to ensure that the entire council new community knows that we are aware um, and we are, we want to be fair to everybody. So that may be an additional $3,000 that needs to be, to be issued out. Okay, so what we'll do, maybe then Michelle is work with our finance team to get that reconciled and to see who and what and all those pieces. Uh, and then we'll look to a motion to bring back to at general finance for that. Okay, so do appreciate it. Uh, Council, I'll pass the floor back over to you, Helen. Okay. Um, well, we all, you all know Sherry Lynn got an email from a, a Mike Davis. Um, regarding something I had said at the political liaison meeting yesterday. Uh, I'm assuming Mike Davis is the coordinator for the uh, cannabis cup that they held just a couple weeks ago. So anyway, he was, Mike Davis had told Sherry Lynn that he was, uh, I guess, upset because I had said at the political liaison meeting that I heard there was children at the recent cannabis cup, or I said something to that effect. Um, so 
uh, I wasn't at the cannabis. I wasn't at the cannabis cup. I never attended the cannabis cup. I uh, I went by hearsay that there was children there, and I shouldn't have done that. I guess I should have. I shouldn't have based my comments on hearsay. I should have, I guess, asked someone if I had concern about that. But so I, uh, so I'll, I'm apologizing to Mike Davis for making a comment where I just based it on hearsay. I did hear that, but I wasn't there to see anything, so I shouldn't even have said anything. So I apologize to Mike and to anyone that's associated with the event, whether it be anyone that helped start it or helped work out there or anybody that, whoever was associated with the event, I apologize for saying that I had heard there was children there. I shouldn't have said it, but I did. So that's that's it. Okay, uh, Nyala, Helen, uh, for that. Um, I know you wanted time to to do that. So um, hopefully Mike is online watching or the organizers of that event, and I'm sure uh, they can um, go as they please. So I do appreciate you uh, bringing this forward. Okay, Council, that actually is everything. Uh, can, that I say, can I say? Can I? Can I comment, please, Melba? Sure. Yeah, I think it's very good of it's very good of Helen to come forward and apologize. I think we all do that every now and then. I heard this and I heard that. Every one of us do that now and then. And then you get a situation like here where I guess there was a bit of detrimental effects, I guess, uh, concerning, um, I guess, the cup that was held and people affected by it. So what I understand from Helen that she is apologizing for those things, not only for what she said, but what it may have, uh, uh, the effects it may have uh, throughout their their uh, organization. So I too, you know, uh, feel bad that uh, something like that uh, may have interfered with their organization and individuals involved. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Nella, for that, Melba. And I do agree with you. It's, um, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 nice to see that we're getting into this 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 realm of of I guess, um, you know, holding ourselves accountable, in which we always talk to about transparency and accountability. And I think this is one, and I do appreciate Helen as well, um, bringing this forward. And I think uh, we have to continue to do more of that <laughs> in holding each of ourselves accountable. So do appreciate it as well, Nella. Okay, Council, that is everything that we have uh, for this um, this meeting. I, to be honest, that was a lot, <laughs> but I hope everybody was uh, engaged and, and there was uh, involved, as, as involved as we can be. Um, again, I do uh, wish everybody a good rest of your week. And uh, please, uh, I know uh, just a reminder that our Council uh, will be on uh, break next week for one week, so there will be no scheduled council meetings next week. So again, uh, do you want to say now for joining us this evening at general council? Um, and at this point in time, we'll look for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Michelle, seconded by Nathan. Oh, sorry, thanks, Melba. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Nyawa to the community and for those joining us. Have a great evening.